Start recording. Okay. Good evening. It's August 21st, 2023. This is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law has been extended. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. But I would like to welcome to the council room tonight, nine councilors. Uh, it's nice to see you all. Um, we do this while providing access to the public. They can either be in the room, they can look be on in real time by Zoom, they can be on the phone, they can watch the live broadcast of Amherst Media Channel 9 or the live streaming. Given the fact that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the August 21st, 2023 council meeting to order at 6.33. I'll call upon each counselor by name. Uh, at that time, you should indicate that you can hear us. And then please remember to mute your mic again. Um, it's important that we know you can hear us and we can hear you. Shalini Balmilne. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present, though unable to join via camera. Okay. Michelle Miller? Present. Dorothy Pam? Here. Pam Rooney? I'm here. Kathy Shane? Here. Andy Steinberg? Present. Jennifer Taub? Here. And Alicia Walker? Here. That means that all 13 counselors are present. Uh, there is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please make sure you let Athena and me know. Uh, to make a comment or ask a question, you use the raised hand button. And if technical difficulties arise as a result of using the remote participation and Zoom, uh, we'll decide how to address that at the time. Uh, there is a change in the order of the agenda as posted. Upon conclusion of items 8A to C, we will take up item 14. With less than 48 hours notice, we will begin the discussion about the process to replace school committee member, Ben Harrington, who has resigned effective today. We're gonna to go on to the announcements. Do you wanna put them up on the screen, Athena? We do have council meetings in September on the 11th and the 18th, uh, and our committees are starting to actively meet uh, as they have been all summer, frankly. Uh, CRC finance, which is tomorrow, um, the uh, GOL, which is next week, and TSO, which is next week. Um, continue on, there's no hearing. Uh, so uh, this is the point at which if you would like to make general public comment and you're in the room, please make sure you've signed up. If you'd like to make public comment and you're on Zoom, please raise your hand at this time. Are there any other people on Zoom who would like to make public comment? All right. Um, we are going to rotate back and forth between the room and the Zoom. And we uh, invite residents to express their views for up to three minutes. Um, this is based on and based on the number of people who have said they want to speak. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Um, and public comments are not reflective of the opinion of the town council. So with that in mind, Athena, let's start with the room. James Musprat, please come up to the microphone, state your name and address before you make your comment. Thanks. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Three comments, brief. The first, uh, both concern parking and densification. Okay, could you please state your name for the public? Oh, sorry, Henry. James Musprat, 38 North Prospect Street. You all recall, I'm sure, the 2019 August report uh, on parking. I would like to re recall your attention to the third item, 
which requires or advises that we maximize underused private lots. Can I ask the council and town management, has there been any progress in negotiating usage of private lots? The second point I think is uh, that the uh, current uh, report before you begin begins with uh, the assertion that the downtown supply um, of on and off street parking spaces is in high demand. Do we have data to document that? Is it higher than in the past? And if we don't, why not? And thirdly, the parking overlay of zoning, which excludes, uh, which excuses developers from providing parking spaces for their residents. There's a direct clash here with difficulty parking and the densification of downtown. I would like to hear what you think about the resolution of that conflict, the fact that that zoning overlay was put in in the past before densification was even thought about. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for joining us and for coming to the town room. Uh, the next person, is there anybody else that has signed up from within the room? Okay. The next person is from Zoom, Ira Brick. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Ira Brick, 255 Strong Street. Uh, considering the problem of downtown parking, please consider this. Instead of paying millions of dollars to either expand the Boltwood parking structure or build a new garage on North Prospect Street, First, implement the several suggestions made by the last parking study, which concluded the downtown has ample parking, nearing capacity only at peak dinner times. Suggestions from that study included shortening parking spots, improving signage, and other simple cures. Also, informal studies by, prospect, by neighbors on North Prospect Street showed that that parking lot wasn't full even on a busy night at the Drake when students were in town. If the problem is worsened since that study because five-story dorms are built with little or no parking, how about those developers of private dorms downtown build their own parking for those residents away from town and provide a shuttle for their residents to get to and from the parking? It seems the plan for a North Prospect Street garage in a local historic district is planned mainly to accommodate those long-term five-story dorm residents. Also, how about the town have a dedicated bus that continuously stops downtown and at all the village centers so that people can park at the village centers and take a bus to town? That would alleviate parking pressures downtown as well as pump some more life into the village centers. Imagine if for the cost of one bus, you could park at any of Amherst village centers and get to the village centers and downtown. It's good for the planet, good for downtown, good for parents whose kids could walk or bike to the nearest bus stop at a village center, and good for village center who might get new business from people who park there and discover what there is at each of them. Please explore these ideas and consider that additional parking lot downtown will mainly help the developers of those private dorms built without parking. They had claimed to the planning board that those students would not bring cars to school but it turns out they did. Also, today I did a very informal 10-minute study of Boltwood Avenue, which seems slated to be turned into a one-way street with the development of the North Common. And in 10 minutes, again, not a scientific study, 13 cars were headed north, four were headed south. And I would much prefer it personally if it remained north or two-way and not south. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, can, uh, Ronnie Parker, I'm assuming that you want to make public comment, so please enter the room. And let me just note that Ronnie will be making a presentation soon after this. So Athena, if you don't mind, we'll leave her in the room, okay? When she's finished with her public comment. Okay, Ronnie, please um, go ahead. I will turn on my video when I make the make my remarks regarding the Human Rights Commission, just in all fairness, I'm speaking now for myself. Um, and it also concerns uh, the parking. I was really shocked to see this on the agenda, frankly, because the very first thing I heard about it, I heard from my own representative, 
who had just heard about it yesterday. So in fact, I haven't honestly had time to look at this and I feel a little concerned that complicated documents get put out on short notice without any of us having a chance to review and comment uh, before it goes to the town council. Uh, but in any event, Ira has expressed a lot of my views, I think, so I will just concur with him. I'd like to add that uh, particularly the idea of the shuttles, I know they do that in New Haven and it works really well. I wish we could look to that. My additional comment is really about a new uh, book that's come out by Henry Grabar. I don't know how many of you know it, but it's a very detailed study of parking in America and the American culture of expecting to arrive at the doorstep of where you need to go and be able to leave your car right at that spot and unwillingness to have to go around the corner to park to go get your coffee. That this is something ingrained in us and something that has a historic basis that he explains in some detail. What's really interesting to me about his work is that it reflects Amherst. He's talking about the country, but it's really no different than us. And a lot of the studies everywhere show that people feel there isn't enough parking. Um, and a lot of money is spent on parking and the results have not been good. The garages are built, people still don't park in them. Businesses move out to the suburbs because they want to be where people can pull up to their doorstep. And then the towns are left with these huge structures so financially, in the long term, this is really not good for us. And I urge everyone to look at um, what he has to say. That You can also Google NTR because they interviewed him, I believe, in May. Um, but I would ask you to refrain from any decision making until many of us who have a great interest in the center of our town, the historic nature of our town, what makes our town so attractive to many of us, uh, can be protected. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And Ronnie, we will have you as soon as we get done with public comment and uh, the consent agenda. Okay. Ken Rosenthal, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you. My name is Ken Rosenthal. I live at 53 Sunset Avenue. I want to speak to item seven, which is the Boltwood Garage report that you are going to receive. I don't know whether you've done studies recently, but several of us have been keeping count of the need for parking as demonstrated by the available parking in the town lot that is on Prospect Street, North Prospect Street. And I can tell you that on what I believe is the busiest time of the year, which was the commencement at U of the University of Massachusetts students last spring, there was never a time when there were fewer than 11 spaces in that a lot that were available, often 15 and more spaces. I don't know how you are determining whether there are there's a need for parking. I would encourage you this weekend, the weekend after this, uh, when the university students come here, to do for yourselves a, a look at that lot and verify that that lot is never full. So there is a question at all about whether at all we need a new parking space, a garage. But if we do, I've read the Desmond report, and I want to give you my opinion, which is that option 2B with two levels in a basement is the option to choose. It would provide 201 additional spaces in town for parking. That would be a lot of new spaces, and that's the place to have it. It's right where there already is a parking garage, right where there are facilities that expect to have parking right next to them, and it would mean again, that you would not need to build or want to build a garage on North Prospect Street, which is a general historic district. Now the clock hadn't started running, so I don't know how much time I have left. So I have one more statement I'd like to make, which is, as I've said before, I think the process you are using for public comment is all wrong. The time you should want to hear from us is after the presentation of a given topic. This is not unusual for Amherst. It's what happened at town meeting, it's what happened when the Board of Selectmen was active, that you, you, you had presentations and then you had conversations by the board or by the members, and then you opened it to the public on the very topic that was being considered at the time. That's when you ought to wanna to hear from me 
That's when you wouldn't hear from me if I was redundant because I wouldn't say anything that was already said, but I might add something that you hadn't heard. And I hope that this council or the one that succeeds you will consider changing your uh, opportunity for public comment so that it comes after the topics that you are considering. And again, let me urge you to take a run down North Prospect Street when the university students are arriving in a week and a half and see for yourself whether the Prospect Street lot is full or not. I think you'll find that it isn't. And that may, that may tell you that you do not need any additional parking at town expense. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Ken. Uh, Jay Silverstein, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. My name is Jay Silverstein. Oh, wait, okay. We can hear you. Now you can hear me? Okay. My name is Jay Silverstein. I live at 32 uh, North Prospect Street, Unit 4. Uh, number one, I'd like to thank Ira Brick for his letter that was printed in the uh, Amherst Indy. That's where I, I thought it was pretty uh, impartial and, and uh, it assessed the, the problem and the situation pretty well. And if uh, you didn't read his letter, I told you where it is. Uh, one of the things I was trying to do before I got here, uh, before I only uh, received this uh, feasibility study uh, today at, at about three o'clock or so, uh, but I tried to find out how many apartments uh, have been built uh, in, in the last few years. And I, I've come up with one East Pleasant Street, 462 Main Street, six, uh, 26 Spring Street, 11 uh, East Pleasant Street, 57 East Pleasant Street, and, and 40 Kendrick Place. And I would imagine there's about four to 500 uh, units that were built. And, and as far as my knowledge goes, I would say there was only about 40, if that many, parking spaces. Uh, so I, I find that very concerning that this board approved this. Uh, I've been a microbiologist for over 50 years, and, and me and science, it's black and white, and there's very few uh, gray sh areas of gray. I was born and raised and, and lived in New York for over 70 years, uh, where I developed New York skepticism. Uh, I find it hard to see uh, housing being built in inadequate parking spaces. Uh, the same council is now trying to rectify the mistakes by devaluing and eliminating the attractive and uh, historical district, uh, which is the pride of downtown Amherst. I don't even know how it got considered to build a parking area on North Prospect Street. You, you're taking some of the, the wonderful stately houses and you're putting uh, brick uh, structures in front of them. Uh, I, I don't know if, if this council's goal is to make Amherst just for students and have uh, residents, a uh, non-student population move out. I, I, I just I see no uh, rhyme or reason for, for your actions. Uh, I, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Susan Musbrat, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Uh, did we lose her in the transfer? Oh, there she is. Susanna? Susanna Mosbrett, 38 North Prospect Street. Um, other speakers have made a lot of the points I was going to make, but I just want to inquire why it took so long to make this report available to people. I understand it's been in hand for several months. And I think uh, it's a mistake to be airing it now at a time when so many people are not here in the town of Amherst. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I believe we're now done with public comment. We're gonna move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the five following items were selected because they were considered to be routine. If you would like to remove an item after the initial motion, please let me know. That does not require a second. And I also want to note that councilors can vote 
but also ask for more information. Actually, we intend to have much more information and discussion uh, on several of these agenda items tonight. So you don't need to remove it to vote on the referral. Okay, is there any question on that? All right, so the motion is to move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. 8A, referral of funding options for increased accounts or compensation to the Finance Committee. 8B, referral of draft Charter Review Com Committee charge to Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. 8C, reschedule November 6, 2023, regular town council meeting to November 13th, 2023. That's because it's the night before the election. And 11A, approval of August 7, 2023, regular meeting minutes. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Um, I think it would be good to get some public response to 8A. Uh, I don't believe we got much when it was brought up before. Um, and I'm just suggesting that we do have it, give the people a chance to talk and to, to um, say something. So when it's referred to finance committee, the finance committee will take public comment and counselors will have an opportunity also to make comments to this evening, as well as when it comes back with a recommendation to the council. Okay, I, I do remind you that the finance committee meets during working hours. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't the hear fi that. The finance committee meets during working hours. I mean, it's not everybody shows up at a finance meeting except other town councilors. And it will, the public it will, rarely shows up there. That's okay. all. We, we did not schedule it for public comment tonight. Uh, perhaps if we need special public comment, we can do that when it comes back. Um, did you want to remove it from the consent agenda? Um, no, I think that's a good idea if you include public comment uh, at some time. I just don't want it to not have public comment. Um, it's, a, okay. it's an important issue. Okay. Thank you. Michelle? I was going to ask to have it removed, but then I heard you say, Lynn, um, so we are going to have a discussion about this, but if it remains on the consent agenda, that means it's automatically referred to the finance committee. Mm -hmm. If I remove it, ask it's for it. Still, still, we'll still be voting to refer to finance and then finance committee will come back with a recommendation at which point the council will either vote for the recommendation or not. Okay, so if I wanted to discuss uh, it being referred at all to the finance committee, then I should remove it. Yes. Okay, then I'm gonna remove it, please. Thank okay. you. All right. Um, that's referral of 8A. Okay, are there any other comments? Kathy? It's, it's a question, the referral of the draft charter review if we have some questions we have about that will we have a couple minutes tonight so GOL hears it absolutely thank you this is only a vote to refer there will be a conversation when we get to 8b on the agenda as with 8a and 8c Dorothy you still have your hand up Okay, so the motion now is to move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. Uh, 8B, referral of draft charter review committee charge to GOL. Uh, 8C, rescheduled November 6, 2023, regular town council meeting to November 13th, and approval of the August 17th regular meeting minutes. Alicia, do you have your hand up? Um, yeah, can we also remove the item on counselor pay? On on counselor compensation? Yes. We've already moved, removed that. Thank you. Okay. So right now, although it was in the original motion, the change to this motion is to remove the item on counselor compensation. Okay. We need a second. I do need a second. Second, Devlin Gothier. Okay. Is there any further question or comments? 
Great, then I'm going to start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. You need to use your mic. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmill. Yes. It's unanimous. Let me just take one moment to mark off where I don't need votes. Okay. So um, we have no proclamations tonight. So let me begin the presentation and discussion session because I think it's important uh, to spend a little more time understanding our agenda. When something is on presentations and discussions, it really implies that there will be no vote. We're in receipt of something. We've decided to have at least a preliminary presentation. It may not be the final presentation, but it is an opportunity for, in the one case, a committee to actually talk about their report and in another case for the town manager and his staff to talk about the parking study. And we'll talk a little bit more about that first. So with that is Ronnie Parker now in, hi Ronnie, how are you? And I also wanna recognize um, Liz Haygood, who's in the audience with us back here. Uh, I believe the two of you are now co-chairs of the HRC. Okay, Ronnie, we need you to unmute. Yes, okay. we are. Thank you. And welcome to both of you. Um, when we received your report, we asked uh, if we could have you come and talk a little bit about the report. And this is that opportunity. Thank you. Um, I think on behalf of the Human Rights Commission, um, I am very, very grateful for you to have read the report and to be here and ask to speak with us about it. Um, I just want to make a few remarks. Uh, one, perhaps most important right now is that a majority of us are new to the Human Rights Commission uh, and have been on the commission for less than a year. Um, I became the co-chair last month and Liz Haywood joined me as the other co-chair last week. So um, a lot of us are new and we are very keen to have a full commission. We have three vacancies. Uh, we are a very, very committed group. We take human rights very seriously in Amherst. Um, having said that, I just want to say a few words. You may already know this, but you may not, um, about what we do. And there are two big things we do. The first thing we do is that we have a lot of events over the course of the year to celebrate the diversity of our town, to celebrate ethnicities, genders, whatever differences we face individually, but are all part of what makes us one town, one community. And so we wanna celebrate everybody. And that's why there are these um, events that we spend a lot of our volunteer time on. So, um, the next cultural origin type celebration is Latinx Heritage Month, which we will celebrate on September 24th, a Sunday from 12 noon to 3 p.m. These events not only recognize and celebrate um, all the richness that is in this town, but they also provide an opportunity for the general public to know us, and to know that they can speak to us if they encounter a human rights violation. Um, and that leads me to the second main function, which is that we do receive complaints from anyone whose rights are violated in Amherst. And we help them find resolution. As you know, we have almost no authority, but we do have influence and we do have um, the human rights which I think at some level we all respect and value. So we meet on the third Wednesday of every month at 
and we invite everyone to attend. Um, I realize the town council is necessarily a formal meeting. The Human Rights Commission is very informal. If you are not a fluent English speaker, if you just aren't comfortable speaking out loud, there's no clock ticking. It's a very free, flexible, and open space in which to speak, and you can be seen or not seen, whoever you are, based on your preference. Uh, we will help with all these issues, and so I encourage everyone who wants to discuss anything related to human rights to come and speak with us. Um, finally, I would like to encourage people to go to the site, amherstma.gov slash HRC, um, to see how you can file a complaint if you have a desire to do so, to see our agenda, to join our meeting. And I do very much welcome everyone to be there. And finally, in order for us to be effective, we do need a full uh, commission. We understand that's coming. I would urge the town council to approve um, whoever is nominated as fast as possible. And especially the case would also advocate for the same thing with the CSSJC, since they really don't even have a quorum, I understand. Um, with that, I would like to end my remarks and ask um, Liz Haygood if she would like to add anything. Liz, why don't you come on up in case we have questions. But meantime, if you'd like to add anything, please feel free to do so. Uh, well, I do have one comment. My name is Liz Hager. Um, Give her the mic. <laughs> I'm the o I'm the lone veteran on the Human Rights Commission, which is kind of by mm. default um, that I accepted being co-chair with Ronnie. I think we ha are a powerful group for the town. I think we are a voice for those who um, don't think or don't know that they have certain rights in the town. I appreciate the fact that even though we have no um, authority to make policy or to um, make right what somebody's um, complaint is that we do have the authority to point them in the correct and the right um, direction so that they know that there's somebody that that can walk them through um, what they need to do in order to find resolution to whatever the issues are that they're facing. Don't go away, because now is the opportunity for the council if they would like to ask questions. Okay. And I would like to start out by saying, I've never been to so many different cultural events. And I wanna thank the committee for all your volunteer time in doing those as you did this year alone, there had to be close to 20 and it was just magnificent. So it does honor the diversity of our town. Um, I also want to encourage the audience and anybody else who's listening, there are openings on the Human Rights Commission at this point, so please get your tap in. Um, so with that, Pat, questions or comments? I have a comment. Um, I want to thank Liz and Ronnie for stepping forward uh, and taking uh, the chair's uh, becoming the chairs of the committee. We lost two amazing people, Philip Avila and Ben Harrington. Um, you've got big shoes to fill. But knowing you a little bit and knowing Ronnie some, you're already filling them. But I really, all kidding aside, I really want to thank you for stepping forward, both of you. We need you. You're welcome. Anna. I echo everything, right? I mean, I think that there's, um, I'll do I'll do ditto marks and thank you all so much for for your work and your service. Um, you had mentioned in your report that you're in the process of going through a review or rewriting your bylaws and procedures to be relevant. And I'm curious what your timeline is on that. And I apologize if I missed that in the report. But you had mentioned that you uh, would want town council approval on suggested changes to those. And I, I'm just curious about what the process is looking like for that, how you're gathering input. Um, if you're gathering input and uh, your timeline. Um, shall I respond? Please, Ronnie. Uh, we, 
we spent, when I joined um, the Human Rights Commission in the summer, uh, that process had already started and we spent a lot of time finalizing it. It is now actually in the hands of, I believe, the town's lawyers or the town manager, I'm not sure. But we would really like to have that set. There's a lot in the bylaws about procedures of um, confidentiality and procedures associated with uh, uh, complaints. So it's really important to us to get that done. We're hoping to have a full commission in the next month and hopefully late September, early October have a retreat. And if we have the bylaws, then um, it will really be helpful with our planning. Thank you. I, I should say, I, I realized I didn't mention the DEI and the Pamela Young and Jennifer Moiston really are the ones who have carried the weight of all these events. The, the events are amazing. I, I first came to Amherst and just looking around my neighborhood, everything's pretty white. And I kept saying, where are the people of color? Where are the people of color? And you go to these events and everybody comes. Everybody comes. You see the full sort of richness of the town of Emmerich. So I would really encourage you all to come to them. They're very, very powerful gatherings. Thank you. Uh, Shalini? Um, I heard you say hi. And I heard you say that uh, you all don't make policies. Um, but I think I speak on behalf of all counselors that if you do have suggestions, for us, the, uh, the council, that we welcome human rights commissions. Any suggestions on any of the issues? They're coming. Excellent, thank you. And also I had a question about uh, community events. So can, uh, in terms of which events get um, organized or supported by human rights, um, it would be helpful maybe for the community to know, like, is, is there a process for them to reach out to you that if they wanted to host an event or is there, yeah, some process for that? I do believe they would first um, get a hold of Jennifer Moyston. Um, the other thing is that during our retreat, which is gonna be the sometime late this, uh, September, early October, that we will look at our calendar and as a commission decide. So if anybody has any suggestions, they should either email our Human Rights Committee website or get a hold of Jennifer Moiston so that we can put it on our agenda for consideration at our retreat. Can I just ask a clarification? Ronnie, what was which is the event that's on the 24th? It's Latinx Heritage Month. Latin X Heritage Month. Okay, thank you. Latino Heritage uh, goes from September 15th to October 15th. And because we wanted to have, last year we had it on in Kendrick Park. There was a question about having it on the town common. And we know that there are already events there, including the ABC Fall Foliage Walk on the 14th of October. And the, um, one the thing that happens every Saturday. Oh my God, why am I- Farmer's Market. Right, farmer's Market. <laughs> yes, so we know that that is gonna be tough. So we're trying to see if we can pull it off on a Sunday and hopefully everybody can attend. I also wanna mention that we're trying to uh, have the schools confirm when they're going to do Puerto Rican Heritage mm -hmm. uh, Day, which is technically the 23rd, but that's a Saturday. So we okay. don't know yet which day that's gonna be on. But great. Jennifer Taub. Um, yeah, I also want to echo what everyone has said. Those the most fun events that I've attended since being on the town council have always been um, <clears throat> sponsored and uh, organized by the uh, Human Rights Commission. They're terrific. So I just had a question, really more out of curiosity. Um, you said in the report that the <clears throat> sometimes when um, you know an issue or complainant comes before or is filed with the Human Rights Commission that you'll have a conciliatory conference. Do the members of the commission actually participate in that? Or is it more staff or both? Uh, no, uh, no, uh, we've actually already discussed this a lot. This is one of the few things that we are able to do. Uh, and it's basically done by 
the DEI, not by members of, we're not trained uh, in doing that kind of work. So we don't, we are not directly involved. Um, but that is one of the few avenues we have, which in some cases, um, you know, you can come to some kind of solution. But I don't think the experience has been, uh, actually Pamela Young should speak about this. I asked about this a lot. And I don't think the experience in terms of finding resolution um, through that means has been as successful as I would like. I'd like to see it much done much more in a much more, uh, well, anyway, I'd like to, I'd like to see more of it done. I think what this raises really is how much the DEI is doing, just the two of them. You know, it's really astounding the amount of work they do. And this kind of conciliation is another thing that they do. Pamela, I think, does it directly. And uh, just so you know, there are so many confidentialities involved. I think that's another issue that commission members are just residents, you know, and it's I, I think there's a hesitancy to get us all poking our noses into all kinds of things that need to be held confidential. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other council questions or comments? Uh, Ronnie and Elizabeth, thank you for being here. Liz, thank you for being here. Do either of you have any final comments you'd like to make? Liz? I do not, but thank you for hearing us out and please take careful consideration to our report. Mm -hmm. Thank you as well. And remember we're here. So there are so many issues that are potentially in our realm. And I hope that you will call on us for advice. I've been told our role is also advisory with regard to the town council. Great. And there's a lot of expertise on our commission. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to getting your recommended changes as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of us. Bye. Yep. Thank you. Um, the next item is the uh, final report about Boatwood Garage. It actually comes in two parts. Um, this was a report requested by the council, uh, and it was a report based on a rumor, which by the way, is not a rumor. When Boltwood was built, it was built with the idea that it could have an additional story or two added to it. Um, I happen to know that from my local historian. Um, so um, we are not taking any action tonight. In fact, uh, because this was placed on the agenda, we were not able to line up the actual consultants and are more than willing to do that. And if there are additional questions or comments, we want, we'll be very interested in them tonight. So with that, I think, Paul, we have you, we have Chris Brestrup, and we have Nate Malloy. Is that correct? Yes, we do. Okay. And we're not really going to do a presentation about the study, Chris, but you were going to do a quick summary. Yeah, I have some opening remarks, and then I was going to ask Nate Malloy to give a quick um, summary of the report, if that would be in order. Please. Okay. Um, so, good evening. I'm Chris Brester, Planning Director, and I have with me Senior Planner Nate Malloy, and we are very pleased to present the Expansion Feasibility Study for the Boltwood Parking Garage, and it was prepared by Desmond Design Management. In the last few years, there have been conversations about whether Amherst needs a parking garage, and if so, where it might be located. And two town councilors put forth a proposal to rezone a property on North Prospect Street to allow a parking garage to be built there. And during conversations about that zoning amendment, many people began to look at other locations to build more parking. One possible location that kept coming up was the existing Boltwood Garage near the Banks Center, and to look at whether it was technically and financially feasible to add another story or two to the Boltwood Garage to gain parking in a location that was already devoted to parking. So we engaged Desmond Design Management to do this study for the town. Desmond is the original structural engineer for the existing garage. 
and we were fortunate that Nate found them since they had the drawings and calculations that were used to design the existing garage. So Nate will now present the Boltwood Parking Garage feasibility expansion feasibility study. And we'll both be here to answer questions. And if we can't answer them, we can come back with answers. Um, but as uh, Lynn said, you may also wish to consider whether you would like to have a more formal presentation from Desmond Design Management at one of your upcoming meetings. So here is Nate to present the study. Thank you. Sure. Welcome, Thanks, Nate. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, it isn't an urban legend, but um, back in the day, there was additional money voted for the garage and it was always, you know, everyone was curious whether or not it was built to that, um, you know, capacity. And so we hired Desmond because they are a leading uh, industry expert in garage design and management. And so the study was really two parts. One was a visual inspection and one was a technical review of documents. The visual inspection was just that. It didn't go into depth. So you could, you know, core into concrete or do imaging and do a really um, kind of invasive review of whether or not the structure is there. They just, you know, they had a, an engineer walk around with staff and look at it. And what they found was that it's in really, it's in pretty good shape. You know, there is some issues being 20 years old, namely around the stairwell, uh, the entries. So there's water damage. Uh, there are some cracks on the under surface of the ceiling in the lower level, which could indicate uh, some drainage issues, whether that's, um, you know, it doesn't look like it's actually impacting the structure of the garage, but there is water getting through possibly uh, there's a waterproof membrane. Uh, and so, you know, what they, they found was that it's in typically good condition uh, and they recommended a maintenance plan of, you know, they said 100 to 125,000 to really fix the spalling concrete, fix the areas around the entries and the stair heads. And, you know, some of it is there's a lot of ceiling and just waterproofing and, you know, sloping of, of walkways just to shed water um, correctly. And so I think, you know, so the visual inspection was that there is some, um, if you actually go, if you're coming in off Main Street, and you hit the garage is actually a dip in the pavement. Uh, it's kind of right out between Bolt, 30 Boltwood and Johnny's. And there's a few areas around there where there the pavement is uh, has slumped. And they actually don't think that's a structural issue. They think that above the garage, there's anywhere from a foot to 15 inches of gravel fill. There's a So there's a concrete um, ceiling above the lower deck, a waterproof membrane, 12 to 15 inches of fill, and then there's pavement and other, you know, it builds up quite a bit. And so they actually think that it's, you know, some of the gravel and the fill has moved. But when you're down in the basement, there's no indication that any of the structure has shifted. So, you know, even if the sidewalk is cracking above or it's uneven, it's not a structural issue. It's a, actually just a, a, you know, concrete or sidewalk issue. And so overall, they thought, you know, the visuals looked good. Uh, the second piece of it was this technical review. And if you read the report, they, you know, they showed a lot of screenshots of calculations. And so what they found was that it's a, a conventional port in place garage, you know, it doesn't use any modular construction. So essentially they came up with a design to have this grid of columns and a, you know, perimeter foundation and then poured it in place. So they, you know, made the forms and poured the concrete, reinforced it, and they built it so that it can support additional uh, levels. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of considerations there. They in their concepts, they used the existing grid of columns and the foundation and said, okay, we could go up over the original garage or we could tweak it a little bit because the garage itself goes pretty much to the property boundary. And as the report noted, you know, a lot of buildings, their front entry and the plazas, you know, would actually be really close to this, um, you know, these new levels. And, you know, there's considerations now for building code, HVAC, mechanical, plumbing, and a number of things that the report didn't investigate, but it did say that, you know, if you were to build up, you'd more than likely need a fire resistant wall on all sides, which is either a solid wall of concrete or some other fire rated material. And then as an enclosed space, you would need ventilation in every level, kind of like the basement level is now. And so they did say that there are options to go up. Um, one consideration is that uh, truck traffic right now you know, delivery trucks will pull through the garage. And if you actually go on Google Street View from like 2017 or 19, there's like two 18 wheelers in Google Street View unloading on the deck. And so we often, uh, the weight limit is exceeded. 
it's not going to cause any imminent structural failure, but over time it could, you know, lead to cracking and things. And so when they're looking at adding these additional levels, the consideration is, well, if you keep it at a standard garage height, all truck traffic cannot then enter the garage. And so the deliveries would have to be made elsewhere from Main Street or Kellogg Ave or North Pleasant, and they'd have to walk through alleyways. And so in one or two of the concepts, they said you could keep the, the first level if you added one extra level. So just one deck that's not covered. You could have it high enough that delivery trucks would still go underneath it. So you could have one additional level that's up really high, you know, 13 feet, you could get trucks underneath. And depending on how big that is, you know, it could be a net of like with something like 80 to 130 spaces. If you wanted to go up to two levels, depending on your configuration, you cannot have truck traffic at all on the garage. It has to only be passenger vehicles. And so although it was designed to have these additional levels, you know, um, you have to be really careful with not just, you know, not just what the, the load is on the, on one level, it's basically the load on all levels going down to the foundation and the columns. So if you were to add a second level, that means all the ground level that's there now, plus the two additional levels could only be vehicle, um, you know, passenger vehicles. It couldn't be anything heavier. Uh, you know, the cost of all this is they said it was two to three times higher than new construction because of the complexities of building on an existing foundation or piers. And then you have to, you can't actually get a concrete truck there. So you have to pump it. Um, there's, you know, extending elevators, changing ramp locations. And so, you know, they used a third party estimator they often work with and they came up with a, it was a wide range, you know, it was like 70 to 130,000 per space, but it was two to three times higher than what a new construction would be. And so, you know, Greenfield finished a garage a few years ago um, and it's, it's modular construction. So it came in these 60 foot pieces segments and it was about say 300 spaces. And the cost ended up being a little over 12 million. They value engineered it down to about 10 million, but that's still, um, you know, that was before all the, the pandemic and price increases. And so, you know, even with taking off what would be considered a nice facade and making things look nice, they're at, you know, over 30,000 a space for new construction. And so, uh, you know, staff, when we looked at this, we, we did actually go back to them and ask if they could discuss a little bit more in an email about the cost. And they said that it is variable. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that what they said in the report was accurate and they, um, Desmond said it was. And so, uh, you know, they said it really depends on how much, you know, what you want the facade to look like. It can look like a utilitarian garage or you could have screening and things on it. You, maybe you have two elevators instead of one, maybe it's the stairwells, how much ventilation you need, um, the drainage, the, you know, everything might need all new mechanical equipment. And so, uh, if it's an enclosed garage to be fire rated, that means every level has to have a sprinkler system. It has to have uh, additional egress and emergency egress. And so it's different than if it was an open air garage where it's open on all sides. And so the report kind of concluded with, right, there's a number of considerations and they kind of phrase it as a go or no go situation. You know, would the town want to study this option further, which would mean actually Right now, they're just concepts. They might look, you know, they're hard line drawings in the report and they might look really good, but they're really, they're just concepts for cost estimating and functional use. Can we actually get a car up the ramp and drive it around? And is there enough space? And the next level would be, okay, if we really like this location, we do more exploratory work on the foundation and the condition of the concrete and maybe, um, you know, the foundation. We do more work on what are the code requirements to go up? What does it mean for the businesses? Uh, and they'd get, you know, more into schematic. So a little further along, or, you know, they said you could also look at other sites to determine, you know, where else could you have um, a garage? I mean, what we haven't determined is what is the spaces we need, right? So they didn't do any of that. They didn't look at a parking demand study. What, you know, what are the peak loads in terms of parking? What's the capacity of our parking system? They just said, okay, this garage was built to accommodate extra load, you know, extra capacity in terms of vehicles. And it could be one or two levels. It can't be more than that. Um, and, you know, the net gain at most is 230 spaces. And that would be, you know, taking over all the parking you see on Boltwood now, the, the, the parking in front of Johnny's and the bank center, all the parking, the surface parking behind Bueno, all the way to the funeral home parking lot. So right now the area, um, the north half of the parking behind, say, Matt's Barbershop, that's not part of the garage right now. That's just surface parking. 
And so their biggest option was to basically put two levels over everything. And that would um, give you 235 spaces. Okay. Um, since one of the questions that seems to have come up tonight was, when did we have the study? So Paul, Paul, can you tell us, or Christine, when was the study actually finalized? Sure. So when we commission a study like this, the consultants put together a study. It comes to the town staff. The town staff pours through it and combs through it, all the information. And then they, they respond back. And we've this is what was going on over the last few months. Um, you know, some of the things that were brought up were that town staff brought up was like there were no estimates for funding. We think they should put an estimate in there. We know the council's going to ask the question about what does it cost to do something. So that's what Nate was talking about, asking for additional um, research into what a, what construction costs would be. Uh, they go through um, spelling and any kind of edits if they get things wrong, you know, things like that. We sort of make sure that they're calling the right things the right things. Um, there was a piece missing from the report initially. So there's a back and forth process. Um, it came to the town manager's office on July 21st. Um, and then this was the, the meeting that we felt was appropriate for it to come to the council for you to decide what you want to do with this information. So that's the timing of it. And I'm not sure if Chris or Nate want to add anything to that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, we didn't see this as a, um, I mean, I think it's good to have this information, but you know, this isn't an actionable item for us. It's really, it's information to start, you know, conversation and thinking. And so, um, you know, the consultant didn't update the data on the report. So um, even with the visual inspection, they came out twice and then, you know, the report is dated earlier than the final, just they, you know, they didn't revise the date. So if you see, you know, there's a May date, I think on one of the reports, but we were having email conversation, like Paul said, later than that. And they just didn't, provide any, you know, revised date. They just kept it whatever they had on the cover page or the front page. Um, I think the fact that they didn't update the date has caused a lot of confusion. Um, so uh, counselor questions. I have several others, but I want to make sure others that have questions. Dorothy. Well, I, I think that's it's been very useful clarification that a report comes in and it's not like, you know, this is done, it's, it has to be looked at and studied by the town. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, this question is for Nate. Um, when you mentioned the Greenfield Garage, um, I, I remember some meeting, and this is a while ago, uh, that was being discussed. And it was being discussed that there were homeless people living in the garage, uh, which suggested that it wasn't that full. Do you know uh, how, how much usage is made of the Greenfield Garage? Yeah. I. I you know, the rates are really cheap, actually, when we go up there, I'm always surprised how vacant it is. And so, you know, what the study didn't say was, how do you fund it and operate it? And so typically, if there's a, you know, a cost to build it, you would say, well, are you okay with a 20 or 30 year, you know, payback? What What is that payback? And so Greenfield was able to apply for grants. It took them, I think, like five years to secure a MassWorks grant, and they had other maybe earmarked funding or state and federal funding. And so they were able to have enough subsidy that the, you know, they can probably have, you know, say um, reduced use of the garage because of, you know, some public subsidies. Typically someone would say, if you're building a garage at so much your space, you'd want, you know, however many hundreds of dollars a month per space, you know, at 90% of the spaces to have your payback. And so, yeah, I've heard that Greenfields isn't that full as well. And some of it could be that you know, there's reserve spaces. So people are willing, even in, in Amherst, to say, spend a thousand or two thousand dollars a year to have a reserve space in Boltwood or other parking areas, whether or not they use it, but they just want that security knowing they have a reserve space. And so it could be that I know in a, the Greenfield garage, one level is all reserved spaces. And whenever I'm there, I actually don't see many cars, but people are paying for them just to have it. Um, you know, the homeless piece, right? There was articles in the paper a few summers ago about how do you manage, I and mean, that's more of the management, right? How do you manage trash pickup? How do you manage, you know, people sitting around the garage at a place to hang out? Um, you know, even kids would use it. So that's, to me, that Desmond wasn't looking at any of that. That's the consideration down the road. If there is something, another structure, how do you manage, you know, all of that? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank Jennifer. you. Thank you, Dorothy. Jennifer. Um, yeah, I have a question. I thought I had read, I guess, <clears throat> in the report that 
if to add on to Boltwood would be more costly per space, but it would still be cost more to build a whole new structure. So is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So I think if we were to look at this more, um, that's something we could explore. So right, typically you wouldn't build a new parking garage with only 200 net new spaces. Well, maybe you would, but I think, you know, typically they might say you'd want to get up to 300 or 400. They, Desmond is saying that the economies of scale happen when you get to a four or five, four or 500 space garage, which I don't, you know, I think that's a really big garage. So typically anything less they said gets more expensive de depending on facade treatment. And so I think they're looking at, you know, typically there's acquisition costs and then there's right, the construction of a new garage. So I mean, I'm assuming that they're saying if you build a new garage at 235 spaces, the total development cost would be more than the expansion of the bolt would at 235 parking spaces. Um, probably considering that there's land acquisition and a number of other things that have to happen to, that drives up the cost of new construction, you know, of, of a of a garage. It, it's not clear if it's you know that if it's equal given the number of spaces. Based on what they're saying, though the cost estimate wouldn't be, right? So I think what they were saying is that typically a community would go and build a 300, 400 space garage, and that would cost more than an expanded Boltwood garage at 200 spaces. Because if you look at the cost per space, the the cost to expand Boltwood is two or three times more per space than to build new. And so what they're, I think what the report was really saying is someone is gonna build a 400 space garage at 20 million or whatever it is, 17, 15 million, which is gonna cost more than expanding Boltwood at 200 spaces and it's gonna cost, you know, whatever it is, 10 million or something. Jennifer, was that? Um, I had a couple more questions. Uh, Please go. So one was, uh, and this might be for another conversation, but did was there any discussion uh, with Desmond when we, well, to, when we look at this garage, are we, do we have a sense of how many spaces would be or monthly or year, you know long term parkers versus in and out because i've always wondered whether we would get more in and out spaces that, than that would, we have now in the north that would be a lot. decision by the town on how you wanted to allocate spaces and what the market was, would bear and we the last question is um with the overlay district there was discussion of a developer build you know we would give away the land and the developer would build the structure so could a developer when you're talking about Boltwood, is it seen that the town would incur the cost, or I mean, there's, or could a developer also? That um, wasn't really. Think... Sorry, yeah, that wasn't really part of the discussion, right? It was really just focused on the structural feasibility of expanding it, and so all these questions about, you know, construction costs or operations and management of something, that would be, you know, the next step if we wanted to move forward, right? Would be okay. What are the different models for building a garage? Is it public-private partnership? What type, what, you know, what does that mean? Is it all private? Is it all public? And so there's probably a number of models that could be used and we haven't really explored that. I mean, I was a little surprised to see pricing in this report because I thought we had just asked for whether it was feasible and possible to build the multiple. So we, we have gotten in, and I think when we get into pricing, which is in this, you know, that opens you mean up co you mean yeah. costs, right? The yeah, cost, yeah, right. Yeah. Then it, it's hard to, so this is, so the, so this is cost and whether it's structurally possible. Mm -hmm. That's correct. It, that's what it answers. Pam Rooney. Thank you. Yeah, those are really good questions. And I appreciate the staff having done this work because it's, um, it's just been, a, it's just been a question out there hanging and it's finally starting to get answered. So I really appreciate that. Um, Nate said uh, that there were two questions that were sort of asked or that the uh, consultants asked them, and that is, you know, what are, what are our needs and what is our capacity in town? And I think I would be very, very happy to um, encourage staff to actually update those numbers that um, the two, was it 2019 study um, had a pretty good handle on the needs in town and clearly we have additional people living in the downtown now and we also have um you know post covid we were trying to see what the results of that are but i would love to get a better sense of what is our capacity in town uh, in the form of kind of an overall review of our municipal parking district 
because I think there are a lot of opportunities throughout the district. Um, Pat? Like Pam, I would like to see an updated report. Uh, the thing that when I was reading through the summary, uh, I got to where they were talking about the uh, building two levels at Boltwood, and I immediately started thinking of the impact on the businesses that now exist around it. Uh, and so I wrote a question. And then as I read further, I found Desmond's recommendation, which is the town consider a site study that would evaluate the prospect of constructing a new parking facility on alternative sites because the vertical expansion would impact every business that is around the Boltwood area and make it, we lose that sense of being able to see, I think they call it front doors of businesses. Um, so I'm very interested in getting the study that Pam is requesting updated and also more information about what other areas. I know there's a lot behind CVS. Some people have talked about the lot near the Amherst Cinema, but I think that would have real negative impact. What are the needs and what are the other sites? And and what then would some of the costs be even tentatively? Because I, I think just reading Desmond's report, they don't really think it's a good idea. We need some to do some repair, but it is not the best idea. Michelle? Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge that I have not followed this particular matter as closely as some other matters. Um, and I recognize that there are practical and political concerns involved. Um, but just looking at it now a little more closely, um, my question is, why are we pursuing um, a site study or even this report when we haven't pursued a demand or a needs assessment? Um, to me, that seems like uh, we're putting the cart before the horse and um, without having a real understanding of what we need in terms of parking and what impacts those needs and um, looking out five years, um, you know, what will impact those needs. I, I feel like we're, we're wasting um, time and money. And when I look at the cost of these options, I mean, I was just floored, uh, the millions and millions of dollars to build a parking uh, facility when we haven't even just really figured out whether we need more parking. Um, and I'll also say that just a quick look at the town owned properties um, online, I noticed that there are opportunities where surface parking, I think, could be uh, creatively uh, enhanced and utilized. Um, and I would say adding uh, signage um, to, to enhance that as well. So my my feeling here is that we should pause on this and we should do a thorough site uh, or excuse me, a thorough needs and demand study um, before we we spin our wheels any further on this. Thank you. Lynn. Okay. So ju just to remind, it was the council that brought the, that requested this study and, yes. the, and the council funded the study and the air capital project. So we were just responding to what the council needs. And I understand what you're saying in terms of, do we even need a garage is the question I think people are asking. I think that, but the question that preceded that was, is the Boltwood garage even an option? And what this tells us is it could be, and this is sort of gives you a framework. It doesn't say we're doing this or we're not doing it. It just gives you information as you start to develop whether there's a need for a garage or not. And then is the, um, Boltwood garage an option or not. So I want to build on that for a moment. Um, we also have a fairly recent parking study that was completed by the town. Um, and before we spend any money updating that, I think we need to determine whether it really needs to be updated and whether we have done everything in that parking study that was recommended to maximize the availability of existing parking. I'm personally not ready to jump into building a new parking garage. 
uh, I'll just be right out there up front. I'd rather see us use as much of our surface parking as we can. I wanna add two pieces of history here. When this parking garage first came to town counts, to town meeting, it was recommended to be a three-story parking garage and it was town meeting that voted it down. In addition to that, it is town meeting that voted the parking overlay that people are now having problems with. So if we want to undo the parking overlay, it has to come back to this council. And at the time that parking overlay was voted by town meeting, and I'm not blaming town meeting, they did what they thought was right at the time, but the parking overlay was voted by town meeting. And now we see a lot more people living downtown and bringing cars. And so it, it may be something that we or a future council need to look at as to whether or not the parking overlay is in fact reasonable anymore. But these are two legacy issues that this council inherited. And I just cannot let go without saying that. I do have a question about the safety of the lower level. And I don't mean in this case, the water safety, but I mean the physical safety because of anybody who might be down there. I know I spent many years driving to Boston and parking and coming out late at night. And I would only use surface parking lots where there was lots of light. I would not use deep dark garages because I didn't feel safe. And so I question and would want to make sure that the lower level of the parking garage is in fact safe. Um, other than that, um, Kathy. Excellent. For those who weren't part of the earlier discussion that happened in the first council rather than some others, um, we did receive extensive parking studies um, as Lynn just mentioned. So I, what I, I'm, I'm gonna make a couple suggestions and observations. I think it is worth coming back to, to this and trying to schedule it as a discussion, special meeting kind of, not a decision-making issue, Lynn. So I know our agendas are packed. But bringing that back and bringing it a bit up to date because the, the last council also voted to remove the North Commons parking lot. And we're about to see that happen, which is a loss of a substantial number of heavily used spaces. So we never did a, like, what does the picture world look like? So I'm not saying that changes dramatically, but it's a fairly substantial loss. Um, so just trying to revisit in that context. Then secondly, to talk about what options do we have? Um, as you just mentioned, Lynn, we inherited the overlay. There were a few members of town meeting who said, oh, but when we voted that, we voted a fee. If you didn't provide parking, you paid into a fund. And I said, I don't think so. I think if that was ever discussed, it didn't go in. And it turns out it didn't go in. Um, that is an approach some other towns have taken. So in lieu of providing parking, you pay into a fee and then the fee can be used for, one could list a, a variety of things and you could give it any name you want. It's an impact fee. It could be toward eventually building a garage. It could be for shuttles. Um, so it, it may be worth looking at not just to let's undo it, but let's make it work better. So I'm just suggesting some things that could be part of this discussion. And there are, there are examples of this in other towns. Um, then the last observation is um, parking garages are expensive, whether they're new or not. I found this study quite interesting, including the very end of it, section six, page two, that said you don't hit any economies of scale till you hit 500. When you're building small garages, you might wanna think twice about doing that. There was the same warning in our parking study that small garages um, you are really expensive and you better think about them um, heavily. You know, and, and they need easy ins, easy outs. So if we ever come back to that, I think we ought to do it in line. So I, I do thank the town for doing this study because the question of Boltwood kept coming up and we didn't have answers to it. So now we have an answer to it, whether we like the cost 
or not. Um, they pointed out by building buildings in the parking lot, it's made it much harder to expand the garage. It's they're too, they're Kathy, very near, but they said we up. could overcome that. So I just want to say we Kathy, can come back to it. Please wrap up. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go, Dorothy. I'm going to skip uh, and give counselors that have not had a chance to speak a chance to speak first. Anna. Thank you. So, uh, in reading this, I was uh, I was struck by some really interesting statistics. And you know, one of the first ones that came up was that the average American driver wastes 17 hours a year looking for parking, right? But that stats from 2017, and our parking study is also several years old now. We also have data coming out about the trends in parking post-pandemic and the trends in ridership on public transportation post-pandemic. And so I, my question, and Chris and Nate, I'm going to send this to you maybe, and if you don't have a way to tell me the answer, that's fine. And it gets to earlier questions, but I, I'd love your thoughts on it, is what is best practice in terms of how often to repeat these studies, right? So- I know that the council requested this and I am grateful for staff for following through on that ask. I agree we're putting the cart before the horse. I, uh, in terms of if we think this is a project that's moving forward at this point. Um, so I'm curious how long parking studies last and how often our habits change, right? You don't necessarily need to answer that second part. Uh, but when we consider things like parking needs now and every single day this gets more true this gets truer more true uh we also know we need things like charging infrastructure we know that that's going to be a need in parking garages looking forward um sorry these are a couple scattered thoughts i had them in separate paragraphs so feasibility includes costs right and to be clear when i'm looking at this i see those multi-million dollar numbers and then i look at our roads and our sidewalks and our dpw and our fire station and it's just a no, right? Um, it's it's not possible for me to justify prioritizing this as a town project in any way, shape, or form unless we got a grant to cover the whole dang thing magically. Um, so that's that's where I'm at on this. But I would love an answer on my question, which I will reiterate because I buried it in there, which is how long do parking studies last in the professional world of planning? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll I'll have an answer. <laughs> I don't know. If you, if um, we had a study done in 2008 and then one done 10 years later. And although some things had changed, they found that overall, right, the kind of capacity of the system, the ability to handle um, peak demand was the same, you know, depending on, you know, system wide. And so I think what you brought up were some good points that in the last few years, though, there's been a lot of changes in terms of even our development downtown, you know, trends in terms of what people are willing to do um, in, term, in terms of shopping, public transit. And so I think that you know, someone could say every five years at a minimum, but 10 years, but maybe now um, enough things have happened that even after five years, it's worthwhile to look at it again. Uh, you know, there's, you know, I think the, what has been brought up are what else can we look at? So we do have different zoning and regulations that could be looked at. The report uh, recommended strategies to undertake. We've done some of those and there's a few that could still be uh, fully implemented. And so, you know, some of it would be the, I know the town has been uh, actually different departments have been doing some kind of point of count and some other utilization studies, nothing like Nelson Nygaard, but, you know, just kind of keeping track of things. And so, you know, a full study could be if to move this conversation forward, okay, what really is the demand? Um, you know, I think this could be a good time, you know, in the next year or two to do that just because there's been a number of changes um, since that study was done. I would say typically though, you could wait eight to 10 years because if, if, if there isn't much new development downtown and there aren't new trends in transportation, then, then, you know, that, that, and then, you know, I think that's a good number, but I feel like in the last few years, there's been a lot of changes. Thanks. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. What would you qualify as significant development downtown in terms of number of stores added or apartments added, for example, when we look at the past 10 years that has changed. And so I'm curious, like, what's the, What's the tipping point roughly? Oh, I mean, I think there's residential units being added. There's a lot of restaurants. And so they both have different, they, they put different demands on parking, right? So restaurants, what the studies found is that there's two peaks actually, lunchtime at one and then evening hour for dinner. And then, you know, depending on um, when cars are used for residential units, that might just be after hours at night. They need overnight parking. They might not be there during the day. And so 
but all you know system wide parking all of a sudden there could be a lot more users downtown right so if we have so many more units we have so many more restaurants uh you know at certain times then there's a, a pinch on the system now i'm not saying like one location right but you know the municipal parking system off street on street everything um and so that's where i think it could be worthwhile to say okay if we allow more development we love more infill with businesses what do we need to support a really vibrant downtown and so is that um you know scattered parking is it better strategies between you know different lots is it a centralized parking facility thank you thanks andy yeah i have uh, three things and i'm going to try and be prompt so if the clock were running i'd be making three minutes um one is that when the parking study was done uh, we had um, a recommendation that we try and find a better way to use a lot of surface lots that are not used during uh, the evening because they are connected to businesses, but they're owned by businesses, which would require uh, negotiation for use of space that's privately owned during evening hours for a public use. And I don't know if any of that has ever taken place, any of that discussion, but that was a key recommendation. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to point out is, is that uh, some of this discussion came about because of the discussion of the Prospect Street uh, parking garage and uh, the search for alternatives uh, rather than building on, on Prospect and uh, the whole idea of um, can we do the addition to Boltwood came from that discussion. And uh, um, so I appreciate the study because I think that it has answered a question that's been lurking out there um, and I think is part of the equation that we have. And the third thing that I just, uh, as a matter of course, I have been ar arguing for a while that we need to make sure that we are adequately using the current parking facilities. And I am not convinced we have, uh, as we heard during public comment, I have never had an experience of not being able to find a space under any circumstance in the current Prospect Street, Street lot, which some people call the CVS lot too. And uh, my uh, suggestion for some time, and I've talked to Guilford years ago about this, is that the problem with that lot is that largely that people don't know it exists and can't find it unless they're uh, really familiar with downtown Amherst because there's that narrow um, alleyway and uh, next to CVS and there's coming around Halleck Street, which is uh, the different direction that most of the people who are using that, um, that would use that lot are probably people who are coming to the cinema, uh, coming to the library, and now coming to uh, the Drake. And uh, that it would make sense to provide access um, from uh, the Amity Street side and signage from the Amity Street side. And so um, you, um, as Guilford said, you could either reverse the one ways or you could make the section to the garage entrance that it would be, or the parking lot entrance, excuse me, two way and um, Andy. not have parking. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Athena for the new color-coded clock. Um, it can't be missed. Uh, We've not heard from Anika yet before I go back to other people who have spoken. Shalini, I'm sorry. Shalini, you're next. So I also wanted to provide some of the context that of the discussions we had in the last council and specifically with respect to the need, whether we have a need for uh, more parking. So I just want to point uh, to the two charrettes or community engagement uh, uh, gatherings that happened in 2014. And there were hundreds of people who showed up for those meetings. And it was a redesign, designing or, or reimagining what our downtown looks like. And the two most important things that most people spoke about was a need for parking and a music venue. So yay, we have a music venue. And parking is still, and since 2014, we have more housing and all of that that's taken place, more 
um, and and then um, Kathy already mentioned that we took away some of the parking in the commons with the idea that we want to keep these critical pieces that are downtown for community gathering for green spaces and push have centralized parking that's in the backside somewhere hidden away and so the idea is to centralize the parking and instead and that's the newer trends instead of each development providing a lot of house uh, parking that you find a way and therefore having that public private partnership that was my question is that still on the table because that was a presentation made to us in the last council as well about uh, I forget what it was called revitalizing downtown or something and one of the presentation items was that um, there was an option for a public-private partnership with parking. Um, let's see, we may have a new, hopefully we will have a new library, so that will also bring more traffic. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that when we say there is a lot of empty space right now, that means we don't need parking. But what we heard from Amher Cinema owners and some of the local businesses was that they're hearing from clients uh, that they don't come because there is a perception that there is no parking. And that's a big reason for people not to come. Um, so the last point is about the signage. And that was a question that have we got the signage up based on the last report? Oh, one more question, not question, but there was a 1996 study done comparing CVS, Boltwood, and Amherst Cinema. And is that still relevant? Like if we do another study, are we going to learn something new? Because that study looked at the feasibility of the three locations. And so if everyone doesn't have them, I can send a copy of that too, because that was done by like town meeting paid a lot of money to do that feasibility or whatever study. Okay, thank you. Anika? Uh, thank you. So, you know, thanks again to Chris and Nate and Paul for following through with the report that was requested uh, by the council. I'm not going to reiterate. Um, I have, I really uh, have the comments that were made from Lynn Michelle and Kathy have really, and Anna have resonated with me, and those really were some of my questions and suggestions coming to date. Um, and I, especially those questions that clarified why exactly this was on the agenda this evening. I hope that that will be helpful to many, uh, many within the public who may have received information that there might be action taken on this item either this evening or in the future without um, abundant input and involvement from the public and also um, that input in having ample notice for such. So I, I hope that this was clarifying for uh, those on the council and also again for those in the public that may have received you know, an urgent call that they might not be involved in the process going forward or there would be action taken this evening. Thank you. Hey, uh, three councillors, I believe all of you have spoken once. So I'm going to start back. Is that correct, Michelle? You've already spoken once. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Um, Dorothy, we're going to start back with you. Okay. Um, I think that Andy made a lot of good points. Um, and, you know, why is this issue before us? Um, you said that this was started by the town um, meeting which I was not very active with. However, I have in front of me the parking garage overlay district. I guess it's an amendment, October 15th, 2021, which is not that long ago, uh, which talks about an overlay district, um, which could, could be used for parking right next to a local historic district. And so that uh, was brought up. Uh, we have talked about this. I've been on the council for five years. So this has been on the issue. We've talked about it a number of times. We've t asked the question again and again, have we followed through on any of the suggestions made from the parking study? And the answer is almost none. Um, there were many of them that talked about better signage, making the spot smaller, all kinds of things to maximize the parking that we do have. Um, the reason that this is, is really, uh, we've been asking for a Boltwood was the rumor that it could be expanded. And that ne needed to be clarified before anybody 
broke any ground to build a parking garage um, cheek by jowl with a historic district. Um, and um, I think that we have to stop talking in circles. We have a parking overlay which says you can build residential apartments downtown without providing any parking. The reason given for that was that there had been a, a very few offers to build downtown, and this was done as a way to encourage development. I think development has been encouraged. I think it is happening, and I think it is time for us to stop that uh, idea. It was based on a premise that turns out to be false, which they couldn't have foreseen. It was assumed that students would not bring cars, and many people really, really believed this. However, COVID made it clear to most kids, I want a car. I want to be able to get home to my family if things get bad. And I don't think that's going to change. So I think that the thinking that said students or young people are going away with cars has been changed. Um, one other question is, is there a, a list of people in line at Boltwood Garage begging for parking spots? Um, I, you know, I personally have never gone in there. I'm like Lynn. I don't go into parking garages if I can help it. I personally don't feel safe in them, okay? But I also don't want a parking garage open or closed, parking garage open or closed right next to a wonderful historic district ruining some of the historic downtown. So we have to kind of put some of these pieces together and think about what is our aim? So, um, you know, it's, it's not that we've been asking for this in a vacuum. The conversation has been going on for a long time and it keeps getting brought up. I am very pleased to hear that we could expand Boltwood, that it could be structurally secure. That is very important. And I think Jennifer's point about um, it's cheaper to build new, which they say about everything, by the way, everything is cheaper to build new. Dorothy, please wrap up. Okay. But we didn't build a new library, did we? Um, because we had some interest in historic preservation. So I think that, that building new is not always the right solution. Um, so that's what I'll say for now. But this is a very, very central, central discussion for many people. Dorothy. First, their home. Thank you. Jennifer? Uh, yes, I just, you know, one, uh, initially I raised my hand to respond to Michelle that the reason the request came is one of the very last things the last council did was vote to make the parking lot, it's called the North Prosper, North Pleasant Street lot, even though it's mostly on, it looks like it's on North Prospect, a residential street in a historic district. The last one of the last things the last council did was vote to make that a parking um, overlay district. I think I'm leaving a word out there so that the town would be giving prime downtown real estate to a private developer to build a garage. And many of us, I guess, to put this charrette also into context, many of us have been going to planning board meetings since 2013 as they were permitting Kendrick Park and One East Pleasant and saying, please, you're make, building hundreds of units. <clears throat> Excuse me. You please um, require the developer to provide parking spaces for the tenants. And that was never done. So it wasn't that it wasn't anticipated for whatever reason we were ignored. And I think there might have always been a plan that the town would provide, you know, land to a developer to build a garage, which will mostly be used, I think, for the tenants of the downtown buildings. And the concern was, which we also asked about Boltwood, is because the overlay district would be allow giving the land to a developer to a private partner, I shouldn't say a developer, to build a parking structure on the site of a surface lot, which is extremely underutilized. Um, and as some of the uh, residents um, said in public comment that they have been tracking even during the busiest weekends of the year. There were two graduations. There was shows, I think, more than one night at the Drake, and there still remained many parking spaces open um, on North Prospect, or what they call the North Pleasant Street lot. And I think that when they do close the North Commons, the, the 70 spots there, 70 plus spots will be able to absorb those. And, you know, many of us have been saying for, you know, I agree that there should be a sign letting people know that there are 70 spots in a surface lot. And I, I guess I would also like to add, you know, as I agree with Pat, there's a, there's always, um, you know, there's a downside to any municipal parking garage. Um, it's not a neighbor that anybody wants. And I've always been concerned is, is that what we want in the middle 
of the main street in our downtown, which is what the North Pleasant Street lot is right next to CVS. Um, you know, it, I, I realize that we don't want a huge structure in Boltwood, perhaps that's, you know, going to be marring <clears throat> all the shops there. But I don't know that, you know, in a small downtown, we want a parking structure looming over the middle of our, our main street. I'm sure we have some other options. Thanks. Michelle. Thank you. I appreciate um, understanding a little bit more about what initiated the various actions to uh, I credit Anna for, for um, making me think about uh, possible mode shifts in transportation and just how that sort of um, incorporates into this, as well as the shift to more electrical vehicles, which um, I think there may be some state requirements that will um, that will make whoever is developing these parking lots, um, they will need to put in a certain amount of electrical um, vehicle charging stations. So in some ways it feels like the studies can't really keep up with the times and everything is like so slow moving. And so I just um, uh, have some concern about, or I flag concern about that. Thank you. Okay, I believe that Paul, yes. Serious? Yeah, I do. I do need to respond. You know, I think one of the counselors said that the town had done nothing on parking on the recommendations, which is flat out wrong. And I think Sean Mangano is here and um, you know, I think he can comment. He was leading the parking leadership team that's been working on these issues. And I think that we want to clarify the record on what the town has been doing. Sean? Sean? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Hi, all. Um, yeah, I just I wanted to we have been doing a lot the last few years on parking. So I just wanted to run through the list. And it's I you know, agree it's not everything, um, but we did go through that report and identify as many of the recommendations that we could start working on. And, and we have. Um, so obviously the, the study of the parking garage um, is, is part of it. Um, we did form a leadership group prior to the last few years. We didn't really have a formal leadership structure for parking. Um, and that was one of the recommendations that there be some sort of leadership component. So we have formed a committee with DPW and planning, uh, finance and public safety and um, the town manager's office uh, that we meet bi-monthly to talk about all sorts of parking issues and, and how we're going to make improvements going forward. Uh, the signage is obviously going up right now. Some of the signs have been put in place. That was a key component of the study. Um, and when that's all up and, and done, that's going to look really nice and, and we'll direct people to parking. Uh, we have improved communication. We updated the website. I want to say we put an insert in the tax bill. If we didn't, I know we were meaning to, but I think we might have. Um, but we did do a lot around communication on the website. Uh, we have had some preliminary public-private partnership uh, conversations around different spots in town. Um, I think that's come to fruition, but we have been exploring that. Um, I know somebody raised that question, um, and that is, is something I know Nate has looked into quite a bit, um, ways we could do that, and that's ongoing. Uh, we modernized the parking permit system, uh, which you all obviously had a huge role in, um, which will bring more money into the parking system and allow us to do more in the future. Uh, we recently converted our parking enforcement officers to parking ambassadors. Um, that the, the last two positions that were filled were parking ambassadors, and they have a much more uh, customer service uh, friendly um, facing attitude to them when they're out there. They're, they're still doing the enforcement component, but We've also asked them to be sort of a resource and a guide to people that might be um, looking for directions and things like that. Uh, we've identified several locations for additional permit parking that will be brought to the council uh, in the near future. We've got a, a number of spots that we can add away from downtown that maybe will keep some cars out of downtown if we can add permit parking elsewhere um, that will be coming to you soon. Um, and then as Nate mentioned earlier, we have been doing parking utilization studies to get a sense of are we at a capacity uh, limit where we do need to start talking about the garage again? Um, and we're seeing it come back, but it's you know it's not to where it was pre-pandemic. Um, so all that's just to say is we are we have been doing a lot. Um, I know there's more work to do. Thank you, Sean. That was very useful. Uh, Jennifer, you have your hand up. No, I just wanted to say that in my referring to my experiences in 2013 and 2014, I know that was way before any of you were here. <laughs> Um, so, uh, thank you for this discussion. I take away from this discussion that before we start talking about any additional parking structures, we need to determine if it's time to update our parking study 
based on the trends and the changes. And that is because we need to determine need before we decide anything else. So unless I hear from a counselor that they would like to have the people who did this study actually come back and talk about the actual structure, I personally don't see that that's the next step because we're not ready to build a new parking garage. Okay, seeing no hands. I'm sorry, Shalini? Just a question, Lynn, can you not see my hand? Oh, should I make it a different color? So it, it, yeah, it blends. Okay, gotcha. Okay, the question though was, um, oh, I forgot the main question. Uh, wait, wait, it's coming back. Um, I still have three minutes. Hold on. <laughs> so Chris Brestrup offered the okay. possibility of having the consultant who did the study come and actually make an additional presentation. Since at this point, we are not ready to commit to a new parking garage anywhere. And if anything, we need to determine, maybe update our need. I am suggesting that that's the next step and that's where we should focus any energy. Shalini. Okay, so my question is that, you know, we do studies and then it, these things take so long. So then the council changes and then we again do another study and like we spend a lot of money on studies and so I don't know if I'm in favor of another study to assess the needs. Like we've been talking about this for a very long time. And, um, but yes, we do need, I do need to, we do need to understand what is the best location. And, and I think obviously we don't have the money to spend on it. So I am interested in finding out if that public private partnership is still an option. Kathy's saying no. Are you saying no? I, I guess, but I'm I'm just going to be straightforward. Nobody has convinced anybody that we actually have additional need. And if we need to update the existing study because we think changes have happened that have made things seriously different, then let's do that first before we spend any time on the council or staff determining if we need a parking garage, where we're going to put it and how much and how we're going to pay for it. And just it's we're spinning our wheels on a question that's premature. Is my opinion, Pam. In response to the very specific question, do we want the consultant to come back and give us more information? I think I'm hearing the answer is no, if that helps answer that question. And I do agree that that updating studies can be quick and dirty, but we should we should be moving forward to identify how to best support the downtown, how to best encourage people to come in and out of town. Mm -hmm. And um, I think some in this room are in agreement that we really are not looking for a parking garage per se. If we decide that we need the capacity of a parking garage, we need to do a complete study on, on multiple locations and options. Mindy Joe. You just uh, so, No, I'm I'm here. I was just slow. Mm -hmm. Um in response to the potential of updating the parking study that was done in 2019 or 2018, whenever it was the Nelson Nygaard study, I would say it's premature to do so at this time because um, the North Common redevelopment is not done. We should not be doing a study in the middle of that. Um, the library expansion project is not finished. We should not be doing a study until that building has reopened and we know what kind of use is going on there. It sounds like our town staff has been monitoring the situation and has not seen, while they've seen an uptick in usage, they have not seen something to the point where the study that we have now is not useful and needs redone. So I would say at this point, 
we let our staff continue working on implementing the suggestions in that study that are minimally cost, continue working and wait until it looks a little more yep. necessary to potentially update that and make decisions at that time, which could be three or four years from now, not now. Right. Kathy. I, I, I'll be really short, Lynn, uh, try anyway. Um, I agree, don't bring the consultant back. Um, I agree, not do a full-fledged study right now. It's the wrong timing. But I do think trying to schedule something about parking with, I know Sean is leaving us, but the leadership coming in, because I heard in one meeting, and I would just like to know this for as an example, that Amherst College has said their alumni lab after five o'clock could be used for parking. So if we have started to identify some potential private lots that at a certain time at night could be used, it would be good for the public to know that. So I don't know what the timing of that is, Lynn, but if we start to have some of that, um, and as the signage goes up, the more we can inform people that this exists, not for debate or discussion, but that would be, it's a, perfect place to be able to park if we really can park there. So that was just said at one meeting. So I just want to say that's an opportunity that we have of empty lots at a time when people might want to come into town, if we can use them. And I want to thank Sean for jumping in to give us a preview of what that report might look like that tells us everything that's been done. I also want to mention, because you have to go out the side door, there's a parking sign right there, brand new parking sign pointing to the back of the building. Just look at, look at it. Dorothy, final comment. We're going to go on. Yes. I just want to thank Sean for always coming in and being so intelligent and giving us good information. And we are definitely all going to miss him. And I really just want to make sure that I say it while he can hear it. So thank you, Sean. Okay. He's staying for the next item. So... And we'll plan on a few more comments at that point. What I'd like to do now is take a, a break until 8.25 and come back. At that point, we will move on to the discussion about council compensation. Eight twenty-five. Please mute your mics and also take yourself off the photo.
No, in any of their lots in general. So if, if it's charged after five, you'll upset a lot of the Amherst College staff and faculty permit holders that park there and take ten thousand of them because they have to then pay. Because right now, not not that they don't get paid, they're booked. I'm sitting in a conference room, not charging my car. With an Amherst College parking, I park in alumni all the time, and so you'll have to figure out a way to college will not like to take the for staff and staff part of their Ladies and gentlemen, we need to resume.
Whoops. I'm here. As soon as we, as soon as you return, please turn your camera on so I know you're back. <laughs> Waiting for Pam Rooney. Anika, uh, Anika, are you back? I am, yes. Okay, Alicia, are you back? Yes, I am. Thank you. And Pam will be joining us in a moment. So, um, hmm? yeah, no, I'm, um, the funding options for into for paying for the increase for counselor compensation is the next agenda item. And, uh, Sean Mangano has joined us for this conversation along with Paul. Um, and so with that, I'm going to, um, First of all, ask Michelle, you removed this from the consent agenda uh, where it, the vote would be to refer it to finance committee. And so as is the custom, you get to speak to your reasons for re removing it. Thank you, Lynn. And I'm, I'm happy to, you know, I, I'm interested in, in listening to the discussion, um, but I asked for it to be removed because I wanted the option to vote against it being referred um, to the finance committee. And my reasons for that are I'm trying to sort of piece together um, the motion that we passed, um, which is I'm, I wasn't there that night for the vote, um, but I am I'm looking at the motion and, and it's a little bit confusing. There were some amendments to it. Um, but it's my understanding that uh, we passed a motion that increased the compensation and asks for the town manager to consider options um, for uh, a supplemental appropriation um, to reach uh, the number that we need to reach. And so I do not at this time at least support um, any delay, which is one of the options um, in the memo that was presented by the town manager. Um, and then I also am concerned about whether if it was decided by this body to do that, um, whether we would be um, in breach of the section of the the charter that requires that the, I'm not really understanding how to read this in terms of the fir first 18 months of the town councilor's term um, so that it's adopted by a majority vote. So if we were to delay it, um, does that breach section 2.4 of the charter regarding compensation for councilors? Um, so I'll um, stop just to... Yeah. Thank you. And and thanks for clarifying your reason for removing it um, from the consent agenda. Uh, regarding the council has already voted to do the increase. They voted before July. I think it had to be the second. Uh, and so this does not negate that. Okay. There will be an increase. All this does is address the question of how to fund it. Okay. So that your second question was do, by by sending this as a referral, does this negate it? And the answer is no, it does not. Okay, but if we were to decide to delay, um, are you saying that we're not in violation of Section two point four of the Charter? Athena, I don't. The think question so. is about a delay of the implementation. Yeah, I, I don't believe so, but we, we could double check that before the council makes any dis final decision. Athena said she's going to double check that. I thank don't you. think there I don't think that would be in violation to delay. But th thank you, Michelle, for raising that question. Uh, Dorothy. Well, when I read the material, uh, you know, maybe I did read it wrong, but I did not say, oh, this is just to let the finance committee decide how to pay for it. I read it. The finance committee could decide to reduce the amount. The science finance committee could decide when it began. Um, and I just thought that it was taking the vote away from the, what we had done in council and putting too much power in the finance committee. 
But so if in fact you are correct that all the finance committee would do is figure out how to pay for it, then that would be fine. But that is not what how I interpreted what I read. I want to be very clear. All council committees are recommending bodies to the town council. The finance committee would not make a decision that would come to the council with a recommendation. Um, so it would be how to fund it. Um, Andy. Yeah, I may be getting to the same area as Mandy because she's our charter expert, but the charter uh, 2.4 uh, actually has two clauses. One is, is that the uh, council, prior council, um, within the first 18 months, um, vote to increase or to decrease. And the second is that it is subject to appropriation. And uh, therefore, it doesn't automatically happen without there being an appropriation. And I think that's what Paul and Sean are going to speak to. Mandy Jo? I just have, a, is it time for comments on the memo or should we be waiting for let, Paul and we, Sean? Okay. Let's have the, um, uh, so I'm going to place the motion on the table have the presentation, and then we'll go to council comments, okay? Um, to refer the options to fund increase in town council compensation to the finance committee with a recommendation and report to the town council by October 2nd, 2023. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Sean and Paul. Yeah, so I'll frame it and then Sean will go into the details. So the council approved an increase in compensation for, for the town council um, and according to the charter. Uh, the, the question to the staff was, okay, now we need to do the funding for it. Come back to us by October 1st with options. And so Sean put together, did an analysis of several options. We want to give you the options that are available to you. And you can choose which one of which of the two options really. There's there's a third if you said, you know, we're gonna take it out of our existing budget, but that's an unrealistic option because you won't be able to do anything else or it could advertise or anything like that. So the and I think Sean can sort of talk about the strength, the pluses and minuses of each of the options. And uh, you could vote those uh, you could refer them to finance committee for further discussion or however you want to handle it. So Sean. Right. Sure. Um, Sean. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot to say. So as Paul mentioned, there's three options, but one is not super feasible. So there's really two. Uh, the first to do a supplemental appropriation this fall. Um, you could consider it when we do our free cash certification and that comes to you all and we we move funds to our general stabilization, to the reparation stabilization fund. That's generally when we consider any supplemental appropriations. Um, so one option would be to consider appropriating the funds at that time. Um, that would increase the uh, the town's operating budget, um, and we would carry that into next year as sort of the new base for the operating budget. Uh, but it would pull the fund from reserve, so we would have to find a new uh, incorporate new revenues the following year because we wouldn't continue to use free cash as a funding source. Um, the second option is to wait until the FY twenty five budget. Um, and to fund it as part of uh, the town manager's proposal for FY25. Um, it wouldn't kick in until halfway throughout the year, but one of the, um, maybe not benefit, but one of the considerations there was when this was at finance committee, there was a lot of discussion about the Jones Library trustees and the school committee um, and their stipend levels. Um, and then there was also, you know, sort of how this conversation is sort of happening off cycle with other bu uh, budget guidelines and budget priorities of the town. Um, so the advantage of that option would be you'd get to consider this as part of other budget priorities um, and potentially have this go into effect at the same time as increases to the school committee stipend. Um, and the, uh, if, if the council wanted to, the creation of a trustee stipend. Okay. Uh, questions? Comments, Mandy Jo. Couple questions that are possibly almost uh, somewhat comments too. Um, last year, when we passed a budget, we passed a budget that proposed a state aid amount that was the governor's budget state aid amount. And uh, during the time we were passing our budgets, we realized that the state aid amount might 
be much higher than the original governor's budget. And you last year presented a supplemental budget that is distributed when the state finally passed a budget, all of that money amongst the three entities or four entities in accordance with our budget guidelines. Um, what is your plan this year regarding that too, given that I believe the state aid numbers that were actually signed by the governor are, I don't think they're as significantly higher as they were last year, but they are higher than last year. And how much money would that be if you're planning on proposing a supplemental budget to allocate the state aid numbers amongst the three or four um, branches? Um, the question to Sean and, and you all, the first option about appropriating funds from free cash to increase the town council stipends, we generally in our budget guidelines say that all of our percentage increases should be the same amongst all of the um, different branches. Wouldn't option one in some sense violate the budget guidelines in that sense by giving the general government a higher percentage than any other government? So since Sean's here, I'm going to defer to him since it's his last meeting. <laughs> oh, thanks, Paul. I really appreciate that. Um, so at Finance Committee tomorrow, we will be, uh, one of the agenda items will be a state aid update. Aid update. So we'll get more into that um, tomorrow. Um, last year, the state aid increase, as you noted, was significant. It was about double what we were expecting in, in um, unrestricted general government aid. Um, this year, it's higher, but it's um, relatively it's relatively a small increase compared to our overall budget. Um, so at this time, we weren't planning any across the board of supplemental increase like we did last year. Um, we do have some action we want to consider. We've talked about the four firefighters um, and, and getting them into the operating budget. So that might be something that comes up, um, but that wouldn't be from state aid. That would be from a, a different source. Um, so we weren't planning on doing that. The Again, the, the amount it's higher this year is sort of within the margin of error in terms of other revenues coming in lower or higher. So um, that wasn't the plan. Um, is there another question? I think that covered most. Of, oh, in terms of the our yeah our general practices, we do like to increase all the operating budgets um, by the same amount. Um, it's produced a lot of budget harmony in the past um, with with all of the four major areas feeling like you know they're all going up the same amount. Uh, when we did increase one operating budget higher than the others uh, when we created Cress, um, there was you know there was a, a uh, after effect of that, that we had to work through with the school committees um, and with the through the budget coordinating group. So um, it, it is something it's not that you can't do it. If there's a new a new thing that's really important and, and it's the council wants to do it, it's, it's your purview. Um, but it is something that we definitely have to communicate and talk through uh, with the school committees. Um, Michelle, Mandy, Joe, did that answer your questions? OK, Michelle. OK. Um, I want to first just make sure I'm understanding this. Um, so if option to delay implementation until the FY25 budget was the option that we selected, does that mean that uh, the counselor's compensation starting next term would be prorated accordingly? So it would not be $10,000. It would be prorated based on half of it. Okay. Yeah. So- I, I think that that's really concerning and, and misleading and it, it, maybe that's a strong word. And, and so um, I'm sorry, res rescue me for finding another word. But um, I think that if we have made a, a, a decision and we knew what the impact of that decision was going to be um, when we made it as a body and we are in the midst of campaign season here and folks are running for a seat on council um, thinking that the council has increased the compensation to $10,000 how do we express, how do we get it out? How do we make sure that people understand that this could be the, uh, that this could change that for them? And, and maybe they depend on that amount of money that uh, when they've decided to run for council. So I, I have a lot of concern about about that. If it were if it were just to say, okay, we're going to put it in, you know, at the time of the budget season, but still everyone's going to get that compensation, that would be one thing. But um, I have a very serious concern about that. I also think um, we knew what the impact of this was when we made the decision, and I just I guess I'm 
a little bit confused about some of the quotes that were taken from the budget guidelines and used in the memo. Um, I certainly appreciate having the school committee and library trustees uh, and having those looked at, but um, to have quotes like, we strongly advise that we avoid taking on any new initiatives until we have confidence that we can maintain our commitments and assess recent new initiatives. That's what we decided when we voted on it. And so I, 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 we fully knew the impact of this when we voted it, and um, and I just this doesn't this doesn't feel right to me. Um, having that option does not feel right to me for for those reasons. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay, so we have all these rules about when the council can raise the compensation. And we followed them. Do those, are there the same set of rules for changing the compensation for library trustees or for school committee? Um, I, I don't think so. Now, I, I, of course, I don't know the charter the way many of you do. But I thought that raising the compensation for the council was kind of tricky, uh, time-driven. And I think that Michelle certainly brings up a good point that somebody who decides to run for the council, particularly after a vote, an increase in pay has been voted, expects that and puts that into their calculations as to how they can do it. Um, the council takes a tremendous amount of time. You have to give up days of your life just preparing for a meeting, and then you give up another day to be at the meeting. So it, it and, and you have all the other duties that you have. It is a very, very big job. The compensation that we recommended, we voted on, is not high. It is still very, very symbolic, but it might be relevant to somebody's decision as to whether they could run and be on that without hurting their family, because that's what we don't want to do. We don't want somebody to serve the town, but to hurt their family and to do things they shouldn't do. So I I, I think that we're, I'm just having the feeling that we made a, we made a decision, we had a big discussion, you felt like we had done something and I feel like it's now being taken away. And so that is why I'm feeling great concern. Thank you. Dorothy, just to answer your question about other elected officials, that is addressed in the charter article four, section 4.1 D compensation for elected officials, if any shall be set, this is for other elected officials besides council shall be set in the annual town budget. Once compensation is set for elected offices, no increase or reduction of compensation shall be effective unless it is adopted by a majority vote of the full town council. So in other words, we cannot raise school committee and Jones Library um, until the July of 2024. Sean? Um, no, I did not. Yeah, I was going to say what you were going to say. Okay. Um, so the, it is different and it is a different process. Kathy. I, I just have, have a question. Um, and actually I cross check, so I have a partial answer. Um, you have a couple sentences toward the end of, could we re reallocate something that's already in the budget for the council? And the one that caught my eye is MMA. Um, and I'm not sure what the allowance is for MMA where we get those of us who go get both our registration fee paid, but hotel rooms pa paid. So I think the entire memo is about $32,500. So that's the first half of the coming year. So it's a question of where to find that money. And I just, that's a question. And I understand that's an uncomfortable question, um, but it would be, uh, do we need all of it? Could we share rooms with each other? hotel wise, you know, and how many people go, I don't know what the actual budgeted amount, because you said there is an inauguration. So that's one. And then Paul, I don't know to what extent in your own manage, manager's budget, there is a flexibility somewhere for up to another five, you know, it's, it's a question of can we piece together 32,500 where not all of it has to come from free cash. So those were questions I was gonna ask in finance. So I'm just asking it now on it, trying to figure out it's the first half, it's the first half of the calendar year that's the issue, not 
the full fiscal year, which would be decided with the next budget. So it's that first half. Um, so those are my questions on something other than just mm -hmm. free cash uh, and a mix, a mix. So I'm not saying it can all come from the other. Paul? So, so the council voted to have this go into effect on January 2nd. That was your action. You also took an act and said, town manager, please provide us with options. So we had to dig in and come up with the the three options are that that are we think could come back. So, you know, I think please don't say, you know, look at this and say you're making us do something. You've asked for options. We're giving you options. The council can act on these things. Um, you know, in terms of using your expense account, um, we will be we will certainly have a certain number of new um, counselors who, by all rights, you should be given the opportunity that you had when you went to conferences or went to the you know, different opportunities to educate themselves about what it means to be a new counselor. Um, the, the, in addition, when the council, the council has certain expenses, when you want to take on a new bylaw, those funds have to come out of your expense budget. Those are your, those are under the council's budget. Um, we would have to poll the counselors and see who wanted to go to the, to the, um, um, to the MMA meeting, if that that's the, that's the biggest expense that we have, and then and counselors, if they want to room with somebody or whatever it is that you want to do, it's um, it's a certain amount of money. Um, I just don't think there's going to be enough there. At some point, you're going to have to appropriate new funds to cover the expense of, of this initiative. And we should, you know, this is recognized. This is an, this is a new initiative by the town to take on, and we're going to have to build that into our budget within the within the framework of whatever you decide to. to provide to us in December, when you give us financial guidelines, this is going to be the first thing that comes into play uh, as we start having requests for new initiatives. Sean, do you want to clarify that or anything? That's that's right. Okay. Anna? Thanks. So really quickly, I, I'm exceptionally uncomfortable with cutting what's essentially professional development for counselors, uh, removing it from the town, paying for it, uh, leads to an leads to opportunity being afforded to counselors who might be able to afford it on their own, right? Who may be able to afford hotels on their own, who can pay for the conference. It introduces a level of inequity um, that I'm I'm extremely uncomfortable with. So I wanted to say that. I um, am confused about, first off, thank you. I know, Paul and Sean, that we constantly are tasking you with, hey, find money. Um, and, and while you manage to do it quite often, I think we may be stumped, stumped you uh, with this one. So my question though, I'm also uncomfortable with this, but, and I echo a lot of what Michelle was saying. I think, I don't understand how procedurally we could go for option two without rescinding our vote. I, and can someone explain to me, like if we, yeah, can you just walk me through kind of, if we voted for an implementation date, do, would we then need to have a second vote to delay that implementation or would we need to rescind our prior vote? Um, and I want to just say like, this is, this feels like it was on finance for not doing our due diligence. And I, I'm on finance, so I'm faulting myself here in terms of looking more closely at our budget guidelines and, and really kind of marrying these. I still would vote for this proposal. I believe this is important. I believe we need to do this. And uh, I'm sorry that we put you in a, in a really tough spot, which I guess kind of negates the apology a little bit, but I do stand by that. Paul or Athena, do you want to speak to the issue of would we have to re- send our vote and take a different one. I, like I said, I don't believe you would need to resend a vote or re-vote the, as Andy pointed out, it's subject to appropriation. So if there's not an appropriation for it, mm -hmm. then it can't happen until there is. Okay. Um, Mandy Jo. Oh, I'm sorry. Shalini. <laughs> I'm thank you, Mandy Jo for that out. Okay. Okay. Um, I I actually just want to echo what Michelle and Anna said, and I think it's 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 uncomfortable, and we have to find the money, and that's hard, but I think it's an important thing to do, and it sends a message that we stand by. We want to encourage diversity. I know you've all. I wasn't there for the discussions. So I just want to say that, even though it's such a small amount, that it's not really going to. Um, pay people who would want to work and can't do it because of the money. But 
to many people, that extra difference is going to make a big difference. So I think us standing by that and being uncomfortable and figuring out however we do it, I think it, we need to stand by that first option. Okay. Mandy Jo? So I have a follow-up question to my first one, which is about the option number one and the free cash, um, because I am very uncomfortable increasing the general government operating budget more than 3% or was it three, three and a half this year, um, more than a percentage that regional school, elementary school and library were also increased. We even had a request from the elementary school this year to increase their budget above the budget guidelines and we refused to do so. Yet if we appropriate this free cash, we would be essentially doing that for ourselves when refusing to do it for the schools. So my question for Sean for finance that I'm not on is if we, if the council favors a free cash option for the first six months of the year, what is the free cash numbers to increase all budget line items, general government, elementary school, regional school, and library by the equivalent percentage. I, I don't know what the 32,000, would that be 3.1, 3.01, whatever that percentage is, I would like to know what that would look like in free cash appropriations for the other three bottom line budgets too. I just want yeah. to clarify, um, clarify the question, Mandy Joe. You mean if we added that to the total town budget, not just the percentage increase in the counselor line. Right, though. to the general, okay. that, it, it's you. essentially a $32,000 increase to the general government Got budget. It. Thank you. And I would wanna know in order to keep the percentages of increase for FY24 the same across the board as our budget guidelines say, what additional free cash amounts would we need to allocate towards the other three? governmental units too. Okay. Sean, I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we can certainly get that number, um, you know, off the top of my head, we're, in terms of dollar amount, we're probably in the hundred thousand dollars or more range. Um, you know, it's roughly the town budget, I think a little less than a third or a little more than a third of the overall operating budget. So if we were going to go up proportionally for all of them, um, I think it's going to be in the hundred thousand dollar or a little bit more range, but I can get the exact number and what that would look like in terms of if they all have the same exact percentage. Thank you. Um, Alicia, you've not spoken. I'm going to jump to you for the moment. Um, thank you, Lynn. So I share a lot of the concerns that have already been voiced, so I won't uh, repeat those, but I did just want to add, uh, and while I do appreciate the work that Sean and Paul put into this, in my opinion, we weren't given any, we were given one option because the other two options don't allow us to meet what our motion was. Um, so essentially the other two options don't even accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. And so I only see this as giving us one option, which is the reason why um, if Michelle hadn't already done so, I would have asked it to be removed because I don't see any need for it to be referred to finance with one viable option uh, because the other options would negate the motion that was passed. Okay, uh, Anna, I'm gonna come back to you now. Thanks, so I just, I wanna put this in really blunt terms. Basically, you're just saying, what you are saying to us is that we don't have this money, right? Like we, we don't have this unless we are doing something inequitably to our other departments that's against our budget guidelines that we set for ourselves. Is that, that's kind of, it's sort of it, right? Like you're saying that what, and I don't think you're wrong, um, that you're saying that we're increasing above two and a half percent for general government by doing this and that we said no to other areas doing that this year. And I, I do think that that's heavy and we need to sit with that. Um, but I, that was kind of a side thought, my first thought was if we go with that option to, just to confirm, it would be roughly, and, and as you, everyone knows, I'm not great at the exact math, but the average math would be, it'd mean the next counselors would receive about $7,500 in their first year and 10,000 in their second year. Is that, that's correct. Okay. So, I mean, I think that, 
I don't like it because as Michelle says, as Michelle said, you know, we had, our, we had voted this and yes, it was subject to appropriation. Um, and I, I get that and I agree. And people may have possibly made their decision based on this. And I also do see this as almost a phased approach. Um, and while that was not what we voted for, and I believe we even discussed a phased approach and vote still voted against that um, in finance. I do, I appreciate that you're getting us to that point relatively quickly. Um, the, I mean, I think we can't, we put you in a really hard spot and I just want to keep echoing that. Michelle? Um, two, two things. The first is, um, I just, I'd like to respectfully um, push back on um, the uh, assertion that we would not have to rescind the previous motion. Um, the motion is very clear um, that we would, uh, that we voted to um, make this effective January 2nd. That's what the motion says. Um, so I don't see how we could, this, this would not be effective January 2nd if we went with option two. So I think we would need to revote this, which in my mind would uh, be very, very unfortunate. Um, I also um, am wanting to ask Andy uh, about where the language in the charter, I'm, I'm looking at it and just trying to determine the language about this being subject to appropriation um, within, uh, so I'm looking at section 2.4 and I just can't find that language in that section. Andy, you may answer this, but that language was part of the motion. It was not from the charter. Oh, okay. I totally misunderstood that. So um, I, again, I'm looking at the motion. And, um, and it's also, it's in the, I'm sorry, it is in the charter. Athena? Could you help me? Yeah, because I can't find that. Michelle, charter section 2.4 under compensation. Members of the town council shall, subject to appropriation, receive compensation for their services as set by the town council. Right. So it's in the charter, but it was it also in the motion? Oh, I think I might understand what you're saying then. So, I mean, because the way that I read that is that's just a basic statement about how uh, members of the town council receive compensation. Um, but what I heard Andy saying is that it was like this additional step that was, it felt like being used to um justify why uh doing this was uh appropriate and so i think i might be misunderstanding that um athena and, i think you want to say something your your question about the the vote in the vote included um a request to for the town manager to bring options for funding the increase it, it, is that what's your question she uh, no, no. What I'm saying is um, the, the motion is very clear that we are making this effective January 2nd, whether we've asked the town manager to provide options or not. We've asked him to provide options, but that does not impact that the motion clearly states that we are making this new compensation effective January 2nd. So, oh, so, the, so that we, the the charter rules in this scenario the charter says that increases in your compensation are subject to appropriation so a council vote to you know the council could vote tonight to decrease the your compensation and it would be in conflict with the charter so it, it couldn't happen so in this scenario it would you know a, a delay because due to a lack of appropriation would be in accordance with the charter and it would also be in accordance with the council's vote. So it's our it is <laughs> the, the charter yes. is is the place where it says subject to appropriation. So whether our motion said it or not, and it did not, the charter trumps the motion. Okay, I understand that. I, I do understand that, but then what 
you know, I guess I, we can move on to other folks here. I just, I don't understand what the effective date in the motion that we passed, um, what was the point of having an effective date if if that's the case? So anyway, we can move on. I, I Jennifer, more, I'll pass my time. So my question was just, should the charter be changed to say that if, like now it says you, the council has to vote within a certain amount of time before the new council is seated but it should maybe be before the fiscal year of the new council, because won't we always be in this situation? That's a conversation that can take place in the next charter review committee. Um, Pat. A naive question. Um, we had the effective date as of January 2nd. Um, it seems to me that if we voted, whichever option we voted on, whether it was one, two, or three, it would go into effect January 2nd. So if we w voted for option two, if finance recommended option two, then our vote would be effective January 2nd and counselors would receive an increase. And then that increase would be larger um, at the uh, FY25. So I don't, uh, and if we just have it all given on January 2nd, both of those things are putting the motion in effect. I, I So I'm, I'm not sure um, that we're not supporting the vote by choosing an option that might delay part of that increase. Can somebody clarify that for me? The way the conversation seems to be going is to confirm what you just said. If no matter which way we would go, we would still be putting this into effect. But it, the question is whether or not by doing the first option as of de January 2nd, 2024, all counselors would begin to receive the equivalent of 10,000 a year. If we delayed it to the budget year, they would only receive 2,500 for the first six months and 5,000 for the, no, they, they would only receive 2,500 during the first six months, but the second six months they would receive 5,000. So as I believe Anna pointed out, it basically would be $75,000 in the first year, 7,500 in the first year. And yeah, thank you. 7,500 in the first year and 10,000 10, in the second year. Yep, Sean. And the other difference too, is just the, the council wouldn't be voting that appropriation until June when it votes the FY25 budget. So you'd be putting it in your budget guidelines, but it would actually be the uh, the June vote that votes the FY25 budget that would be established in the appropriation. Right. Dorothy? You know, we this is a town council of regular people. And we made a vote and it was clear what we thought we were doing. And the fact that you can take what we did and compare it to different documents and say, well, it doesn't have to be that. It could be this. It could be that. The fact that you can do it doesn't mean that you should do it. Uh, it certainly makes being on the town council not something that many people would want to do. Um, it was clear what we meant. It was clear what we said. If it wasn't clear, we should have been told at the time that we needed to th rethink our motion. You know, I, I, I just find so much of this discussion extremely distasteful because because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it when you know that that is not what we meant, what we intended. And we have people who have taken out papers to run for town council. They've done it with a certain understanding. And now you're letting them see, oh, hey, they can they can take it away anytime they want. And I, I just think that's not right. and It's not fair. So we want good people to run for town council. It's a very big, big job. It's a difficult job. And I, I think that we shouldn't play around showing all the things we could do. We could do a million things, but should we? I don't think so. That's it. 
Andy Joe. Another question for Finance Committee to consider if this gets referred to them. We voted a stipend of annual compensation of $10,000 um, and $12,000 for the president. We didn't say monthly compensation of whatever that would be, like $860 something. So I know we get it monthly right now and we've divided it evenly monthly, but wouldn't it be possible to for one year um, in the budget guidelines to avoid this free to avoid the free cash pay the stipend unevenly over the course of the year so that it's still ten thousand dollars over the course of the year but the first six months are the 2500 that is budgeted right now and the last six months of the calendar year are equal to 7,500 instead of a typical normal 5,000, 5,000 split that we would think of. So I would like the finance to, and then, you know, you it would be funky for one operating budget year, but it might solve or be possible and solve this concern. Anna. We want good people to run for council. We also want good people to work with the council. And I'm really concerned that the way this conversation is going is making people not want to work with the council, uh, meaning our town staff who worked incredibly hard on this. And I, I want to just be really clear that we asked for choices. Um, this is not a malicious document that Paul and Sean gave us. They are, they're trying, and I'm not doubting that for a moment. We asked for the coulds. Um, they found some for us. It seems pretty clear to me in this discussion that this needs to go to finance to discuss. Um, that referral is, is becoming really very clear, even though from the, the outset, I appreciated Michelle's um, withdrawal of this from consent for the reasons that she provided. Uh, my question is, I've got another procedural question. Hopefully it's an easy answer. We kind of raised it on the side, but I'm curious how the council, how the next council could vote the appropriation in the next year if it impacts their own salary, uh, if that's when the appropriation would happen in the next budget. Wouldn't that be, thanks, Athena. Paul or Sean would probably be better at answering this, but if, if the appropriation were in the budget, then the council votes the budget. But is or, that impacting their salary for the coming year? Like if we're saying that the appropriation is changing, because we're saying, wouldn't that be impacting their own salary and isn't that going against the the rule that says they can't vote to ch raise their own salary. I don't think so. If, if the vote is to raise the salary and we it comes to us, therefore, in the proposed budget from the town manager, all the town manager is doing is following the vote we've already taken. Yep. And so we are not violating that rule. If I can add, so the charter has the power of state law. So in the charter, it says, here's how you can adjust your compensation. As long as you follow the rules of the charter, you can adjust your compensation however you'd like. So I think that's, you know, you're talking about a state ethics um, concern, but we, we, a lot of counselors do that every time when you vote the tax rate, you're, you're impacting your taxes. You know, there's lots of actions you take that are more global. This one is very explicit and it requires a public process that everyone can witness. And, and the reason the charter has it happening before June 30th is because they want that to be in advance of whenever the election is. So whoever's voting at the election has full knowledge that you adjusted your compensation however you did, and they can make a judgment on your performance at that moment in time. Is that all the question? Can I, oh, can I follow up on that really quickly? I'm sorry. I, I'm calling the question. The question's been called. Do I? Is there a second? Is there a second? Second Rooney. Second Rooney, okay. The question has been called, we'll vote on the actual motion. Just We need no. to vote on the preview, on whether or not we end we are, the discussion. Okay, we're voting first of all on whether or not um, we're going to cease debate, okay? Uh, this is whether or not we're ceasing debate. And the, there's no comment at this point uh, because once a question's been called, 
you move immediately to the second and then you move to the vote. So a uh, question has been called on a Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shelley Von Milne. No. Pat DeAngelis. We move now immediately to the question that's in the motion that's before you, and it's to refer the options to fund increase in town council compensation to the finance committee with a recommendation and report to the town council by October 2nd, 2023. We'll begin the vote with... Um, Alicia has a hand up. Uh, Alicia. I'm not sure if I can ask this question right now, but I'm wondering what a no vote means. Like I, it doesn't refer to the, to the that's finance, but question. then does it just mean nothing happens? Uh, it would probably mean that somebody is going to come forward with a different motion. Okay. But the motion on the table that we have to vote on is yes to refer or not to refer. Okay. Does, does that help, Alicia? Yes. Thank you, Lynn. Andy, do you have your hand up? Yes, um, I would think, and Athena can answer this question, that since the issue that was on the posted agenda was referral, that um, if uh, the no vote prevails, that it would then come automatically, it would have to be brought, I can't, it wouldn't be automatic, but that you would have to bring it to a future council meeting where there's been uh, notice that that is the agenda item for the meeting. The item listed on the agenda is funding options for increase to counselor compensation. It's not specifically a referral. So the discussion can go outside the bounds of merely a referral. Okay. All right. But in fact, the motion we're voting on is to refer the options to fund increased in in town council compensation to the finance committee and a recommend with a recommendation report to the town council by October 2nd, 2023. We begin with uh, Lynn Griesmer, I'm an I. Mandy Johanneke. I. Anika Lopes. I. Michelle Miller. No. Dorothy Pam. No. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. No. Shalini Bon Milne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. The motion passes um, 10 in favor, three opposed. Now is the time. I'm sorry, Jennifer. A quick question. Um, I should have asked this before. So we referred it to finance. Can they consider options other than the three, like Mandy's suggestion? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. So always welcome. Um, now is the time. Sean, you can't leave. Where are you? Did he already leave? I'm in the back of the there room. There he is. He's sitting there. All right. I want you to put Sean up front. Big on the screen. That is, that is the last this, thing. I this is to. our time. Sounds like maybe for Sean's last meeting, we shouldn't do this to him. So, Sean, we're not happy. We're happy for it's you. No, I just heard the conversation, and I, <laughs> that was not the intent of that that uh, that memo. So I apologize. Um, we really did just want to give you the option. So sorry that that was the uh, the last topic you'll remember me by. But. <laughs> So, Sean, I'm sure different counselors would like to say something. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying one of the things that I appreciate most about Sean is he understands government, he understands program, and he understands how to translate that into budget. And that is a skill 
not often found in a financial person. So, Sean, thank you. Thank you. Others. Kathy. Just building on what Lynn said, Sean, you already know how I feel about you leaving, which is devastated, but <laughs> wishing you the best. The other thing that Sean has done that I think is mir miraculous is when he's faced with what seems like an impossible set of uh, moving forward, he finds creative solutions and brings them back to us um, that are often thinking out of the box. You go, whoa, where did that come from? And he does it so efficiently and in such a, a friendly way, it, rather than saying, oh, yeah, yeah, what you've asked me to do. So thank you so much, Sean. It's been fabulous working with you. Thank you. Anna. Uh, Sean, I will, I'll, I'll compile all my thoughts into an email and send it to you in a timely way, which means probably the day before you actually are, are leaving us. Um, but I, because I feel like that might maybe be your preferred method of hearing this. Uh, but I just, I thank you. Uh, you work magic. I don't know how you do it. And I'm just incredibly grateful to have learned even just the tiniest bit from you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Dorothy. Um, well, I, I just want to compliment Sean on what I call his cheerful equanimity. Um, he is also both uh, objective and fair. And I usually feel like I'm understanding what he's talking about, which is really quite an accomplishment. So thank you, Sean. Hey. Jennifer. Um, yes, I want to, echoing Dorothy, um, as a non-finance person, I really appreciate how you can explain things in layperson's terms that I can actually usually uh, follow the presentation, which I have not often do when it's a, you know, a, a finance um, discussion. And I just so admire your cool under pressure. I, you know, don't know how you do that either. It will uh, serve you well in uh, every place you go and your new um, employer's gain is certainly Amherst loss, but we wish you all the best in your uh, new endeavors. Shalini. Everything that everyone has said, Sean, that so appreciate your thinking out of the box, your kindness, your just, just made everyone feel so comfortable to ask even the stupidest of questions. We're going to really miss you. And we all, all wish you a, a very happy, successful career next step. Thank you. Andy. Well, I've already um, had an opportunity to meet with Sean and uh, express my feelings, but I just, for the public to know, I really have enjoyed working with you. I was very sad when you left the first time, when you left the schools. I was glad when you came back. I'm sad that you're leaving now. Um, it is, you've been a tremendous support for the finance committee. I don't know um, how the finance committee is going to survive without your guidance and organizational skills and the knowledge that you provide. But, you know, we will do our best. Um, and uh, I want to just uh, therefore thank you. Also, I've uh, relied on you for advice on other things that, um, for example, my uh, MMA fiscal policy committee meetings, you've been uh, planting very good ideas that I've uh, used during committee meetings and not giving you credit because I've taken them for myself as the committee member. But in any event, um, thank right. you right. and best wishes for um, success at your new position and uh, getting back to um, a school system and being able to work in one system that is not multiple towns and um, is an entire K-12, I can understand uh, why uh, it's a logical decision to make for you. Just sad for us. Thank you. Pam? I think he'll get bored with that simplicity and he'll come back <laughs> following on Andy's um, cycle of events. Um, I would say thank you, Sean, um, again, for the plain language and for putting up with the 
the pushing and pulling of people in the community who I think don't mean to be controversial, but they're trying to grapple with something. They're trying to understand the issues and they're trying to make their way through complex budgets that um, that they, you know, they feel so strongly about. So thank you for putting up with us and um, and and consider coming back when you when you get bored. <laughs> we hope. Pat. The microphone. It's been a privilege to work with you uh, on so many levels. You're intelligent, you're ethical, you're creative. And more importantly, in some ways to me, is that you have gracefully done your job. And sometimes in conditions that have been abusive or angry or stressful. And I think that takes a toll on everyone in this community. And your loss, it really brings me to tears because you are an incredible young man. Thank you for all the work you've done for us. Thank you, Pat. Anika. Yeah, so I echo all of the appreciation and I um, personally, I have learned a lot from you. Um, I really appreciate how you have brought perspective and you take all viewpoints into consideration. I think you've broadened the perspective and possibilities of for the entire council and what we can do. You set an example of the um, balanced and best practices in, in making sure that our entire town is represented. And I also really appreciate how you have brought forward a hope and possibility in ways that we are limited and there does not seem to be a way forward. So thank you for all of that and wish you the, the best of luck in everything that you do going forward. Thank you. So that was incredibly uncomfortable and I really appreciate <laughs> everything you all said. Um, I don't want your meeting to be any longer than it has to be. So I really appreciate it all, especially emails that you all have sent. Um, I've enjoyed working with all of you in various roles, different committees, um, and everything I wrote about town staff and, and the community is, you know, I truly believe you have a great town staff. And, you know, when I leave, there's going to be two people that are going to step in and they're going to keep everything moving forward. And they're, you know, they've been serving the town for a long time. Um, so I think, you know, the only thing I want to say is just, you know, be proud of all the good work you've done in the last three years. If you look three years ago, you know, I'm only using that because that's my frame of reference for when I started. Um, the town has done a ton of, you know, amazing things across the board and all departments and the council is the one who, you know, you approved all those things or set the goals to achieve those things. Um, and sometimes I think we lose sight of, of all of our accomplishments and everything the town has done. So, um, I would just say, keep that in mind. It doesn't mean we don't need to keep doing more and, and keep getting better um, and, and making improvements, but you know, we've done, a, there has been a lot of good work done um, and thank you all. And I just want to note that whenever you need a pick me up, we'll be sending you a link to this tape so that you can see what we've all appreciated all these years. Only the last five minutes though, right? That's like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> thank you, right. Sean. So thank much. you all. Have a good night. He's gone. Yay. All right, you can come to finance committee meeting and see him tomorrow. Um, all right, we have, uh, uh, we're done with this. No, we're going to be. Um, so it, this, the charter requires that in every year ending in four, that the charter be reviewed by a committee of residents, not including no elect, no presently seated elected officials, okay? And that year is 2024. And so in order to get the ball rolling, I uh, spent some time drafting a charge. It is not perfect. I expect there to be lots of comments. I will tell you, it was a pleasure to speak with Michael Ward from the Collins Institute, who was a consultant to the Charter Commission. And he asked lots of questions about how things were going and is actually was willingly, willingly shared with me uh, charges from other Charter Commissions and particularly the work that 
he's presently doing with Framingham, which is one year ahead of us, but has the same requirement every year ending in three. Uh, and in fact, in, in drafting this charge, I drew heavily from it. One of the things I want to point out, because I believe this is already a serious misunderstanding in our community, okay? This is a charter review commission, committee, and that is the name. That's what the charter says. Mass General Law 43B, Section 10 is very clear. This review cannot change the composition, the mode of election or the appointment or the term of office of local government legislative body, the mayor, the selectman, the city or town manager. So in other words, it cannot change the council town manager form of government we have. It cannot change the number of councilors we have and it cannot change the length of our terms. There are some people who believe it could lead to massive changes that would require an, a new, brand new charter commission. What this does is create a body who is first and foremost needs to understand the parameters of their job. And that's number one under their job. And then after that, engage in extensive public dialogue that leads to finally coming to the council within the year of 2024, unless they ask for an extension, we've had to do that during COVID once, um, and they make a recommendation to us at which point we either accept their recommendations or we, the council, the seated council at that time, either accepts their recommendations individually or collectively or whatever. And if there's any other massive changes that have to go to the legislature, then they do. But I wanna be again, very clear. This is to review the existing charter. It is not to create a new one, okay? So with that, uh, if you have the, the vote, which we did take is to refer this to GOL, they will come back to the council and they will come back to the council with a recommendation as for changes to this charge. And if you have things you'd like them to think about now or in the future, please let them know. And I just want to, in our motion, Lynn, can I suggest that if counselors have questions or issues that they want GOL to look at, that they send them directly to me right. and not to the full committee? Thank you. And also, what you're sending is not recommendations for changes in the charter, but recommendations about changes to the charge for the charter committee. Um, this... I'm trying to, I know we voted it, but we voted it for, uh, that it must come back to the town council by October 2nd. Okay, uh, with that, Michelle. Um, is this only being reviewed for clarity, consistency and actionability or is, so can I just, I just want to make sure I understand the process. So Lynn, you developed a charge. I so I did. Right. And, and we're, uh, go ahead. Sorry. And it's referred to GOL. GOL may have to look at issues regarding this to make it more clear, consistent, and actionable. They may also have to look at it and say, you know, we think the Lynn, the committee should do this or that. Lynn, I think yes. the, the motion that the council voted in consent was for a substantive review and a review of clarity, consistency, Thank you. and actionability. Perfect. Thank you. So, sorry about that then. Thank yeah. you very much. Mandy Jo. Um, I'll try to be brief since I sit on GOL. Um, so I'll just talk about some general notes about the charge. Um, I'm concerned that the proposal is that they use, if we even have them appointed by January 1, only 11 months of the require the, the charter's allowance of a year. The charter also allows 
the committee to request an extension. Um, so I don't think we should, I think we should aim for a December 31 date for the final report and frankly, fully expect that they'll need an extension. Um, and um, I don't like in the draft that there's all these interim dates. I think it sets the committee up for failure. I, I So I would go to the charge part and really um, make it a little more succinct and not put dates in it. Um, uh, it, the same thing is I feel the charge part is too prescriptive. We should just say how many reports we want um, and where the feedback should be done and when it should be done. Um, uh, the abbreviation, this is a really minor one, but the abbreviation of CRC 2024, I think is awful. I don't think we should abbreviate this committee's name at all. We should just refer to it as the Charter Review Committee. Um, otherwise, People are going to be so confused. Um, and then uh, just another brief one is the appointment is suggested to be till December 31st, but I think we should actually leave it as through the presentation of the final report to the town council okay. so that we don't have to reappoint them or go through anything when they ask for an extension of their report. I'll I'll get it all to you, Pat, um, okay. when I've got a bigger one, which means, Athena, can you send the council the Word document version so we can send okay. track changes? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kathy. Is it, Mandy already covered one of mine. Don't abbreviate the name. It, it was the first thing when I got to the end. I go, oh, no. <laughs> um, um, I don't know when GAOA considers this, but I thought it was a very useful Lynn when you just went quickly through what this review does not include, cannot change. So I think when this goes out and people are applying for it, it would be good to just do an addendum or something to it and say, by the way, the review can consider a lot of things, but it can't do the following A, B, C, D, just so people don't apply for it, thinking they're rewriting the whole, mm -hmm. a larger thing. So however that can artfully be done, um, I don't have a good suggestion. And I do agree with the comments Mandy just made. Okay. Michelle. Um, I have a question about who's eligible. Um, so is would somebody on this current council who is not going to be an elected official, either by vote or by choice, uh, be eligible to apply. It, it, it seems like a, a, a former counselor would be a good person to have on this committee. So I'm just wondering in terms of the pool of people, would a person that's currently a counselor be able to apply to be on this commission, even if they're holding the elected office during the application process? The answer is if they're not going to serve during the term of the committee they would be eligible to apply. I think one of the questions that we also have to wrestle with is when are we going to do these interviews and when are we going to come forward with an appointment slate? Okay, okay so just to follow up, um, our, uh, at the end of our um, term here for these 13 counselors is prior to January. It's... it's the, the end eight. of our term is the day that the that the new council is sworn in, which is January second, right? Two thousand twenty four. Yes. So, if the term of appointment here is January first, would that we need to adjust to that? We would adjust that. Okay. Thank you. The, the charter states, Michelle, that the members of the committee shall be voters not holding elective office when appointed. So if the appointments occur before the, this council's term end, then a counselor wouldn't be eligible. Right. And one option that has been suggested to me from time to time is that this council appoint a certain number of the members and the new council appoint a certain number of the members. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. And would we need to how would we uh, formalize that such? Which, well, that's that's part of what CRC will, I mean, uh, GOL, will, okay. I'm so sorry, what GOL will now discuss. Does that make sense, Michelle? Answer your question. Okay, Mandy Joe. 
So Michelle brings up a good point. And while I am I am quite thankful that Lynn has drafted this and got the conversation started on this, the charter just requires that the town council provide for a review in every year ending in a four, which I interpret as meaning we need to at least create the committee and appoint the members sometime during 2024. The charter doesn't say the review has to be done by the end of 2024. It has the review being done within one year of the start. And so I think the question that this council has to you know, debate and deliberate on is should we be appointing any of the committee members at all, or should we just get the charge done and leave it to the next council to do the interviews and the appointments of the members themselves? Very good question. My goal was to get the conversation started. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so we've already voted on the motion. Is there anything else that people want to talk about on this regard to this one? Maybe Joe, you still have your hand up. I know you have a lot to say, but maybe not now. Okay, then we are going to, we've already voted to reschedule our meeting. Um, and we are now on to topics not reasonably anticipated. So on... Um, Sometime on Friday, the clerk of the council, clerk of the town, received a resignation from Ben Harrington. Uh, and that resignation from the school committee, which also means for any other committees he um, serves on, uh, uh, is effective today. And the charter is very clear and state law backs it up. Um, that we have basically 45 days to appoint his replacement, okay? And this is something the first council had to do when Eric Nakajima decided to take a job elsewhere. And the packet in your folder tonight, which we did not place in the folder till this morning, is the packet of all of the material that was generated through that time, okay? And the reason I put this on the 45, I mean, on the uh, 48 hour agenda is because that 45 days is gonna go real fast. Um, in this particular instance, because it was effective today, therefore I did draft a proposed timeline, but this proposed timeline is based on the process laid out in this memo. And I, I hate the feeling of being rushed. Uh, I will say that the process in this memo did seem to go well. It's very comprehensive, but it also did mimic to some extent the process we were at that time using when we were appointing ZBA, planning board, et cetera, okay? So, um, and as you can see from the timeline, which uh, literally begins with his resignation um, and the effective date, um, the hope is, and I don't even know for sure that the school committee is going to meet on August 29th, but that I would have a discussion with the school committee about this process. And we would then, even to the point by September 11th, be looking at draft questions uh, with the idea, and this is where it gets really, really tough for all of us, um, that we would be posting this, we would sol be soliciting the questions, we would get statements of interest back from people and we would then move to actually interviewing in public um, the candidates that apply. And the tentative dates that we've set, and we don't even know if the school committee is available or whether we have a quorum of the council. Again, this is a draft proposed timeline. I can't say that enough. Um, would be the last week of September because we have to complete this process by October 5th. By, my, by our count, right? So 
uh, we were meeting about this at eight o'clock this morning. <laughs> so if I look a little um, tired, it's because it's been a long day. Um, so I'd like any thoughts or feedback or questions that people have and a sense of that we're, we're gonna move forward. Pam? What is the length of term for this person given that there are um, uh, elections coming up anyway to fill this office? Right. Uh, the term would begin as soon as they're sworn in after we vote. And the latest we would vote according to this is at the end of September. They would serve until the, the 2nd of January. Um, I guess we're going to all town town government will turn over that day, and they uh, and just to be clear, they cannot be listed on the ballot as an incumbent. That's part. That's by state law and also charter. Excuse me. On the income, they just can't be listed. They can't be somebody listed on the ballot for the school board already. No. A person who is applying, who has is going to be on the ballot or the school committee mm -hmm. or any other one can apply, okay? But when the ballot is published, if that, that person is chosen and they're a candidate based on having turned in their papers and so forth for the term beginning in January, on the ballot in November, they cannot be listed as an incumbent, oh, that, yeah, that even though they will have served for three months as a school committee member. Does that, that's very, that's a very critical, important question. Uh, Mandy Jo. Um, so a couple of things. Um, the last process we used, I think, mimicked sort of our appointment process that we had at the time for planning board and ZBA. We've since changed that process slightly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not, not enough that I don't think we should be, I, I, I don't think we should be changing what we did last time for school committee this time too much at all but something like the statement of interest i think instead of using what we used last time for the guidelines we should just pull the requirements from our current policy um so that it matches completely um and and there's no confusion there we just we have a whole section on what's required in it um and we should just pull it the length the all of that um i am concerned about the tuesday Thursday, September 26, 28 timeline, we have till October 5. Um, it might be worth, we have a council meeting on the 2nd. Um, one, one thing I don't like about the 26, 28 is splitting up the meetings. I don't think last time we needed to split them up. This time we didn't. We maybe we'll have more applicants. I don't know. Um, but the 28th is a scheduled TSO meeting. Um, I, I think it's a scheduled TSO meeting from my calculations. And so, you know, I, I would almost say the 26th, if we can get a quorum of all bodies, I don't know whether the school committee is scheduled to meet the 26th. They, I have not had, we, we should figure that out. Right. Yeah, right. Um, and then if, if the 26th, we can't finish, I would say finish up on our scheduled council meeting date the next Monday. And just to um, mention that has to be a joint yeah, meeting. Yeah, so I would start the joint meeting at 6 p.m., something like that. Um, but we definitely need to talk to the school committee to see what date the 26th or th they might need to, if they have a meeting scheduled for them, we might have to go to the 3rd right. of October um, for that that one. Um and and I would last time we last time we only noticed the first meeting for interviews and we actually did the selection at a second meeting according to the bulletin board notice. I don't remember doing it that way, but I would make sure that our bulletin board notice says the first meeting can be both. Um, right now, the the notice we used last year doesn't say that. Um, right. And. The, so the the timeline. I just want to clarify. Yeah. The notice would say that we can also hold the meeting as well as, as decide. Yes, and if we need to push the meeting to a different day, we could. But 
plan on the first meeting being both. It's what we do with other things. Yeah. Um, the draft timeline has Thursday, September 21st, as all statements of interest are due, but it does not indicate when the clerk must determine eligibility by. I think it has to be if we aim for um, a September 26th meeting, the clerk would have to determine eligibility by Friday, September 22nd, because that's when the meeting would need posted and all of the candidates' names would be listed on the posting. So uh, that's one day, not the three we've used in the past. Um, so we might want to move the statement of interest deadline a little earlier to give the town clerk's office more time to determine eligibility. And I can move it earlier if we hit the you, you no the distance. 21 days. Yeah. Um, I was rereading the charter on that, and the charter actually says 21 days in advance of the meeting we're going to vote, not 21 days before we close the applicant pool, which is a slight difference from our procedure. So I don't think we have to have it, quote, open for 21 days. We do need to list the notice. And although I, I get where you're going from, which yeah. is another reason to maybe push the meetings to October yeah. 3rd. Um, yeah, I'll I'll stop there for other people to comment. Well, for now. I I would be more than glad to have the uh, clerk of the council also send this in word to people if they want to provide feedback on the timeline. Yeah, there's no. Yeah, I I will then use the timeline and this model to also um, end the process that we now use for ZBA and planning board to update this. Um, okay, Sh Kathy. Uh, Ma Mandy hit um, several of my questions, but one of them is my memory, and it could be faulty, but I set, did set through it last time, is that we both heard from the candidates and voted on the same night. Um, so if you just, so, so it's Manny mentioned, so you've got it happening at two things. So just figure out, I don't know what the second one is, but the first is the 26. And the reason I'm raising that is unless we get a huge number of people, it feels, uh, uh, very burdensome to have people have to come twice, you know, first talk to us and then come, whether it's two days or six days later, to watch us vote on them. Um, and so just to have a, you know, one hour, whatever. Um, so th that would just be my try to make that clearer so that we actually get some applicants for this. Um, otherwise, it looks like it's a lot of work for, as Pam said, three months. Um, right. And then the only final thing is, um, we've all pointed this out, that if someone is planning to run for school committee, and that they want to apply for this, they understand they still have to run for school committee. You know, Absolutely. you know, just make it really, really clear when when we when we make this statement. This doesn't jump over that. So thanks, Kathy. Uh, good points all around. I remember us taking the vote that night, but I could be wrong. Huh? Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I have a question, a few questions, actually. So in the description, um, before I just comment on that, is that something that goes out in the release so that potential candidates re receive the description um, to understand the role? Is, is that what that? It is. Okay. So I'm wondering, given um, sort of the state of affairs and that it's probable that in the next three months there would be uh, uh, more commitment <laughs> sorry Kathy um I know that sort of is is um oppositional to what you were saying I agree we want to get people but um it it may require uh more um, commitment than just the typical meetings um and so I wonder if we want to make that clear I assume anybody following m might have that hunch anyway, but, um, and then the other thing is I see here, new members are expected to attend charting the course. Um, I'm not sure if that workshop is something that's going to be offered during the time period here that we're talking about and whether it makes sense for them to take that. Um, and then the last comment I have is regarding the questions. Um, I mean, 
it seems to me that there are a lot of questions here that are, they're all really important, but um, that if it's only a three month uh, gig, I just wonder if uh, all of these questions are needed um, in order to screen somebody for eligibility and make a decision. Thank you. Thanks. All of those are good points. I think we need to assume first and foremost that anybody who puts themselves forth as a candidate understands the uh, environment that they are stepping, proposing to step into. Uh, second of all, I I couldn't agree with you more. When we did this the first time, I think the election had just been that fall and Eric stepped down right after it. So there was like at least nine to 10 months of serving before. Um, so the person had a much more serious ability to jump into the job. Um, so, uh, so the, and the questions, I think these are the questions from the previous one. It, they don't have to be the same questions. We will, I will solicit questions from each of you individually and compile them. And we'll have a discussion about that at the meeting on the 11th if not the 18th. I'm sorry? And I'm sorry, yes, Anika. So, uh, excuse me, I think Kathy may have answered this question and I did not hear. Does anyone remember uh, approximately how many applicants there were last time? It was my recollection was four. It's it's in the document, oh, but it's you. also in the agenda. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Mandy, Joe, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, part of this timeline says that tonight we're going to authorize you to modify and publish the notice of vacancy. Yeah. Um, is that something we need to do tonight? Because we don't have a draft notice of vacancy at all, and we don't have draft dates and we haven't done anything, but I understand the need to potentially do that if the goal is to publish on August 30th to ensure that the notice of vacancy is up 21 days before statements of interest are due. So Athena, what's the thoughts on that? Athena and I discussed this earlier today. Go yeah, ahead. We, we talked about that this morning. The, the council didn't vote in 2020 when, when it went through this process to authorize the president to publish the notice of vacancy. I don't think we need to do it this time. We don't typically authorize the president to publish any notices. We just do them because they're required. So I don't see that as a requirement. I think it would be good to list the timeline and the notice of vacancy on the next agenda so that the council can look at it again before it's published, like uh, you do in CRC. You share that with there, the committee. There's no way to wait until the 11th. Oh, the deadline's before the 11th. Then I think we just need to figure out the dates and publish it. I don't think we need to authorize the president to do it because you don't publish it anyhow. Let me just say, I've already drafted one and it has a huge number of blank dates but it's almost identical to the one that's in your packet. I just, there's no sense bringing it forward until we had this first discussion. Um, and it does have one other significant change, which we didn't happen to realize uh, when we did this the first time. The last one cited, cited the wrong law. It cited the law uh, according to select board because we built this upon the select board's policy and in the- um, The reference to MGL. The reference to the state law. And is, the, and we've already caught, Athena's already caught that. And the reference to the voting requirements is incorrect too. I spoke with right. Lauren this morning and she confirmed that it's gonna be a, a majority uh, of the town council and the remaining members of the school committee present and voting. So I think what was in the memo from 2020 was incorrect. And that was a carryover from what was copied from the select board process when it was Aaron, Aaron Nakajima. Um, the other, one of the other things is that the uh, school committee has a requirement that they meet in person, but I believe they also allow um, virtual participation. But for this meeting, the council rules will apply for the joint meetings with them. So that if somebody has to be in, you know, 
Seattle, they can still participate remotely. Unless the school committee has a separate remote participation policy. I thought they voted to go back and maybe they allow remote. I don't know. I'll find out. The, let me just say, because this happened over this particular weekend and the availability of various people, I could only get it as far as I got it. So. The so, short answer is we'll publish the notice before the deadline. <laughs> so and, we, I don't think the and council just, needs to take a vote on Just so, to be very clear, the notice that I've I I used exactly what we have here. So if there's things in here you feel should be changed, let me know. Th there are. So I feel like I have okay. some questions about some and that I, I'll make some comments on it. Um, okay. I think we also need to pull this council before you publish that about whether the council counselors can make the dates that are being proposed. Well, that's... Um, but I'd, I'll make my comments on the notice that was used last time in the third paragraph um can you read which is the notes? one of these these pages are not num it's page eight of the memo from three years ago um it yes. uses the phrase if selected individual if the selected individual also wishes to be on the november 2nd ballot for a two-year term they must follow the same process as any other candidate um i i don't know how relevant that is or it needs reworded because the statement of interest is due about the same date that you have to turn in papers to be on the ballot so it's not a selected candidate needs to follow the rules um it it's a potential candidate or something because papers are need to be filed about before we're doing interviews papers have to be filed um, so I think we need to modify some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the The next paragraph again is talks about um, serving on JCPC and budget coordinating groups. Since this is only basically a three month term, I would just eliminate that yeah. thing completely because I don't think it'll apply. Versus last time um, it was a fifteen, a twenty one month term we were appointing for JCPC. Yes, JC we call the. Um, we call the meeting where we do the fiscal uh, mm. interview a JC a budget coordinating meeting. Yeah, but there's particular members appointed to the BCG. So I mean, you can leave it in, but but think about that one. Yeah. Um, the next paragraph says candidates must be physically present at the meeting in the town room in order to be considered. It's actually kind of an awkward requirement because we published that notice before COVID hit, and then we had a fully virtual <laughs> meeting. But right now we're in hybrid, so I think we need to think carefully whether we would require candidates to be here or whether candidates could attend virtually, um, just like committee members, counselors I can. personally believe they should be allowed both options. Um, so, but, but again, something in the one I'm looking at that mm -hmm. needs looked at closely. Um, and then uh, just some you know, minor things about days based on the the timeline you presented. Right. Okay. Uh, Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. I was just wondering if um, Athena could clarify um, what she meant when she said majority of the members present in voting and if that would apply to like overall people in the meeting jointly between the two committees or if that's separately. Thank you for the question, Athena. It's a majority of the members of the town council and the remaining members of the school committee together. So it's the collective body. So there's 13 of us and presumably four of them. That means it could be as many as 17 people. And therefore the majority of 17 would be nine. That's just an example. Does that answer your question, Alicia? Yes. Is that the way that it was done last time as well? I'm sorry, I didn't. Yes. Uh, no. The the memo that was included was incorrect, but I don't think it. Made it was sense. done that way. I mean, we. It so, was. Uh, I think last time we did a poll, and then a motion after a yeah, poll. Yeah. Right. 
I, I remember asking the people from the school committee if they wanted to speak first because this was going to be their colleague uh, and then counselors weighed in, so. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, I thought last time it had to be a majority of the council and a majority of the school board. If it was, it didn't, it, it, the way the vote went, I don't think it mattered. I don't think so. I think we just counted the votes. I Jennifer. We, did too. We, we had the Can people. We, and I will say, I would just want to mention, Athena has, as recently as today, checked with our legal counsel. And this is the read she got from our legal counsel for this time. Is that how it was done last time? It was specifically it had to be a majority of each one of each the, body. I don't Page remember ten that of the way. PDF. The charter, the memo that was included in the packet in 2020 was incorrect because it says abstentions and um, absences don't count. Uh, we can't hear you. The memo, the reference in the memo is incorrect from 2020 because it says that absences and abstentions don't count. The charter says. Roll call vote of the town council and remaining members of the board committee or authority. Um, Lauren's interpretation of the charter and the, the general law section doesn't speak to the number of votes required, but that it would be a majority vote of the town council and the remaining members of the school committee. So the, if the council outvoted the school committee, that's just it, that it, it it's a very in unbalanced uh, meeting. I no, which is one of the reasons why, with the chair of the school committee, uh, we agreed that I would ask for the opinions or the comments and from the school committee first, because we were trying to give some recognition of the imbalance. But you're correct; the town council could outvote the school committee. There's no way around that. I'd have to do the math, Jennifer, to to go back and check how many votes each one got and so on from 2020. But I believe the, the winning candidate had a, um, it was 10 votes and then the next highest was six. Uh, but the vote isn't broken down between school committee and counselors. So I'd have to, I just have to go back no. and do the math. The ultimate vote to elect um, was 16 to zero with one abstention. My, my notes say that the winning candidate had three of the four school committee members and seven of the voting counselors. Thank you. Right, because I think they had to have a majority of each body. That's how they got the three. No, the that's no, that's not what Lawrence. We we definitely we didn't. It, it was it. as is written here that we knew it had to add up to nine. You know, right. if we were all there. So the, the whatever the source of the nine was, yeah. Mm -hmm. The legal reference that was in the memo in twenty twenty refers specifically to cities, and the vote quantum is slightly different in that section of the law. So our charter governs this process for Amherst. The that particular. MGL reference outlines a different process for a select board, different timeline and everything. Um, Alicia, I'm gonna skip to Anna since she's not had a chance to ask any questions and then come back to you. It was actually just a quick comment on that is that process that we just discussed and debated or tried to figure out uh, kind of a callback to an earlier conversation. Is that something that a charter review commission might suggest changes on in the future? Um, the would I that think, be within the realm of I think the way our charter is written is consistent with state law so i'm i don't know but th that's certainly can be advanced to the charter review commission committee uh alicia uh thank you my my question is very similar to anna's um because i read the memo and so i'm slightly confused um, and so it doesn't explicitly state in our charter that it needs to be this way or is there the ability to interpret it differently. 
when you say needs to be this way? Like, does it explicitly say it needs to be a majority of only all or both committees combined? Or is that up for interpretation in terms of meaning that we could decide to do it by majority of the council and majority of the school committee? Athena? When our legal counsel and I spoke this morning, we reviewed relevant sections of the charter, including other sections that refer to the full council, sections of general law that referred to the cities that, that were cited in the previous memo, and the section of the law that applies specifically to vacancies on school committee in cities. And she and I agreed that the reading of the charter that would be the most sound is that the number of votes that is required would be a majority of the two bodies, the remaining members of the school committee and the town council. I would strongly advise against trying to interpret the charter in a different way from what our legal counsel has advised us. Are there other questions, comments? Clearly, there's a lot to follow up on this, and I'll be doing that in the next couple of days. Okay. Um, we do have a few more agenda items. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, we have no appointments, and uh, so we're going to go on to committee and liaison reports. CRC, Mandy Jo. I don't think there's anything to report since our last meeting. Okay. Uh, elementary School Building Committee, Kathy. Kathy, were you? Uh, we have a meeting this Friday. We had to reschedule it because we didn't have a quorum. Um, and... The recent resignations actually affect our committee a lot, but anyway, we're at we're at the point um, after we hear some design updates, we will be getting another round of cost estimates. It's part of this de design detail, and so when well, we meet in September, to... at the end of September, we expect to have those. If unless we hit a snafu this Friday, okay, and. Well, obviously, one of those positions is the superintendent. The other one is Ben. Ben, and Aaron. so that will be filled by somebody of equal. Um, yeah, and I, you know, Paul can. I don't know whether Ben can still come. He said he's he's there as a school committee slot, technically. You know, I so well, you know, I leave that to the town manager and you to. Yes, yeah, you know, so case. just Paul has to sue it, but but I. I've counted up and it looks like we have a quorum regardless of what I think the total is. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, finance committee, Andy. Uh, uh, finance committee meets tomorrow at 3.30 and uh, the agenda is uh, one less item than, than, than I'd reported at the last meeting, but uh, we are going to review the last budget process and how it worked and make recommendations for the next budget process, which we wanted to do when Sean was still available because he was such an integral part of the budget process. Um, Sean, as, report, as he reported, is gonna give us a more detailed um, report on where the budget stands uh, now with changes including changes in appropriations uh, estimates, which we now know are final uh, numbers. So he's gonna make that report. And then we uh, principally will be discussing the two referrals made at the last meeting, the uh, policy on uh, street lighting and uh, the portions or the, 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 the specific referral that was made regarding the uh, rental registration. Um, so that's principally what the agenda is with the usual additional things like public comment and all. Um, and I, I really urge finance committee members to bring your calendars because we're gonna have to schedule some other meetings in September. 
um, GOL, Pat? GOL hasn't met since our last report to the council, but we'll be meeting Wednesday, August 30th at 9.30. Okay. Jones Library Building Committee, Anika and Paul. Yeah, Jones Library hasn't met for a while. I know the staff, the planning department and inspection services and fire met with the architects and their consultants today, which is a normal process that we do in terms of going through their project to make sure they understand where all the um, decision points are. So okay. it Anika, moves did forward. you have anything to add to that? No, I did not. Thank you, Paul. Okay. TSO, Anika. Similar story. We have not met. Our next meeting will be August 31st at 7 p.m. Um, AHRA, Michelle. Um, well, it, clearly our <laughs> report did not happen tonight. So I think it was supposed to be tonight. Um, so I just have to speak with um, you, Lynn, to decide what is best, either the 11th or the 18th, depending on load for the right. agenda. Yeah. Okay. Any liaison reports? Dorothy. Um, CSSJC would like to have its vacancies filled so it could have a quorum. Thank you. Okay. Jennifer? Yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't able to be at the uh, last affordable housing trust meeting, but they did vote that they will be appropriating some of their funds to the Ball Lane development. Okay. Thank you. Any other committee reports? Uh, we've approved the minutes. The town manager's report, Paul. Thanks, Lynn. So uh, to answer Dorothy's comment, um, we are scheduled to be interviewed. I am scheduled to be interviewing with the chairs of both the CSSJC and HRC for membership, I think, next week. Uh, we are trying to get to the August 30th um, or 31st um, TSO committee meeting, if we can accomplish that. Um, and along the same lines, a question came earlier about the HRC bylaw. The HR Human Rights Commission has come up with recommended changes to the, its bylaw. The uh, DEI director had and, and look, took it through her sort of legal lens and had some additional changes or different changes. So I've asked her to sort of chart those two different versions out on a chart that we can then present to the council for consideration for changes to the, the Human Rights Commission bylaw um, after we looked through it with our town attorney. Um, you were invited to a groundbreaking at the Centennial Water Treatment Facility. That's been canceled. It's going to be raining. It's a messy construction site, um, and it's just what wasn't going to work out. Uh, so, and also, both of our it was is quite our state representative wasn't going to be able to attend. It was a question whether our state senator was going to be able to make it back from Boston. So, we are just canceling that at this point, and we'll come up, you know, present to the council at some point. Um, it, it's an active construction site. Um, along the same lines, uh, East Gables, which is the uh, single room occupancy uh, project at 132 Northampton Road, has their ribbon cutting on September 22nd, I believe, at 1 p.m. Um, the bid block party is um, on September 21st. That's right. I think we have these dates, right? Right on these dates. Doing okay? Okay. Um, let's see. The um, the town common uh, construction is now scheduled to begin on September 11th. Uh, you will see activity the week before as the town staff go in and remove some of the uh, pertinent uh, things that we own, like the parking kiosks and the uh, benches and other things that are there. Um, then the contractor will come in and uh, cordon off the area that they will be working. They'll use so that means the parking lot will be out of commission effective September 11th. At least that's the schedule that we heard this morning. Um, so um, that will impact a lot of things. Um, and we're working through a lot of the different things that happen on the town common, including flag raisings and uh, other events. And we'll be making, you know, Mary Maple, everything. We'll be working on different locations for all of those things. Um, the we put out a bid for additional roads for road paving and we have not seen those bids come back in yet but there are about i don't know maybe a dozen roads that are listed in the town manager report that are up for being paved 
the um, also put in extensive, there's some uh, um, articles about dams given all the rain. And I just want to give you a sort of, sort of a, a synopsis of what's already on our website about where we are with dams, including the four that, that the water department's dams and then the one at Puffer's Pond, which also, also is adjacent to a dike. So um, again, we're losing uh, Sean Mangano at the end of this week, very uh, big shoes to fill. And, you know, I think, um, you know, he's going to be a great loss. He's just taken on so many different things. And, um, but you said a lot, you, you all had a lot of things, nice things to say for him, which he was, he hates. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, and the last thing is the police uh, chief search. So I want to start putting some dates down for folks. Um, as since that is now confirmed, we didn't want to do any of the outreach until after Labor Day, given that people, a lot of people are out during the, the um, academic year, during, during the summer. So on September, we have con uh, contracted with a consulting firm, Gov, Gov HR, who specializes in this. They will have two consultants who will be in the town on September 11th and 12th, and they will be meeting with um, lots of different constituent groups. They'll have two public forums that will be open to the public. They would like, we'll be working with them to schedule um, target areas. They want to meet with um, young people and, you know, have a basically bring pizza and try to encourage young people. They really want to hear from young people, um, you know, and just different groups on those two days. Um, they will also be meeting with police officers and um, with um, department heads and different people in the community. Then on the following week, September 17th and 18th, I think it's 18th or 19th, um, 18th and 19th, they will doing, we'll be scheduling one-on-one -on -one interviews for everyone on, if you want to, you don't have to, everyone on the town council, everyone on the CSSJC, everyone on the Human Rights Commission, uh, former members of the Human Rights, of the um, uh, CSSJC, we're going to try to try and include as many people as possible in those one-on-one -on -one sessions. We think those are really important opportunities for people to say what they really want the consultants to hear. After that, the consultants will take that information, digest it, help us put together a profile for um, the new chief. Then we will start the recruitment effort for that chief. I also need to be putting together a basically a search committee that will and we'll be putting out a request for people to apply to be on that search committee. Um, and, and that's a requirement of the charter as well. So, and I want that committee to have some designated members, but also members of the public. So that will be open. Um, and so we'll be working on that this week as well. There's a lot of, um, just so you know, there are, our, hum, our human resources department has been really, over, they're fully staffed now, which is good news, but they've really had a lot going on lately. So we're still plow, plowing through all this, but we'll get it done within the next week or so. So if there are questions on that, I think that's the big news thing, item for us tonight. Okay. Anna. Oh, is that my, sorry. Is that my name? Um, um, beefy report. Dang, this was, uh, it was great. I needed like chapters and stuff. A uh, couple of questions, a cup, one, two, three, four, five questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. The report references a presentation from fellows and sustainability. Can you give us a little more information it doesn't need to be right now, but it said they gave their final presentation, um, the sustainability fellows. And I'm just curious what uh, that was about and if they had recommendations or thoughts. Sure. So it was a, a presentation they made verbally to, um, I think they did, they did actually both did uh, a PowerPoint so I can get those slides and share them for you. They, we just had uh, staff come in and they did a presentation, but yeah, I can get that. Just mostly curious. Uh, so, okay, I've raised this question before and I'm almost hesitant to do it again because I know how tight these funds are, but I'd really like to know what consideration is given to modes of transportation when repaving existing roads. So we got in this beautiful list of roads that we're trying to get through all of them. Um, but things like a painted shoulder or a painted bike lane, at least, it might behoove us to know rough cost estimates or feasibility considerations for that. Uh, I'd like to believe that it's less expensive to do that as we repave. I know that I'm sure Guilford would explain to me 17 reasons why I'm incorrect on that, but I know that we have a lot of requests come in through, or maybe not a lot, but we have requests come in through JCPC or resident requests for bike lanes and sidewalks. 
can we get a better understanding mm -hmm. of what it would take to do that when we repave versus standalone projects? So we are scheduled to have a meeting in September at TSO where our town engineer will come in and talk about roads, update, you know, it's basically the same presentation we did last year, um, which I think a lot of counselors found valuable, but it gives you, you, you there's a lot of been discussion of roads since then gives you the opportunity to talk to the town engineer directly into Guilford. As so well. I, I did ask the question at that presentation last year. Yeah. And so it'd be really great um, to get even just the, like a list of considerations. I know yeah. the costs vary widely, but it'd be really helpful if that sure. could be part of that presentation, knowing that it's coming. Can I ask the date of that TSO meeting? I don't think we've said it yet because we have, we have um, two different groups coming in. We have trees coming, tree the tree warden coming in and, um, the roads we haven't I haven't scheduled them yet, but there's two meetings in September that, and we'll okay. advertise that in advance to you. Thank you. Uh, last last two questions. Um, it was only four. I cut one out. So the targeted outreach to specific community members. Um, that it, I'm down to the uh, police search, police captain search, chief search. Um, that included staff, and our staff are absolutely part of our community. I agree with that. And how will we ensure it's not just staff? Um, and then key staff are also listed in the one-on-one -on -one meetings. And so I, I, how are you ensuring balance in that? I'm open to whoever you think they should be meeting with. <laughs> okay. We're just sort of pulling that together sure, now. Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. so if you have suggestions of, of groups or individuals who really, you really like them to talk about, please send them. My yeah, friend. I will. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is uh, you had said that you're hoping for as many opportunities for all of us, I believe, to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Is that what you were mm -hmm. saying with that? Okay. And so we'll be able to reach out and schedule those. So, yeah, so needed. we'll reach out to you. It's the two days. It's the, the uh, 18th and 19th. And so we'll have sort of, is that right? Uh, so uh, during the course of the day, um, there'll be like 20 minute time slots or 15, whatever they do. Yeah. And sure, then, sure, and sure. Sort of like we'll ask it, you to it sign is up. the 18th and 19th. 18th and 19th. Yeah. I got all of them in under my time with answers. So thanks. Calony. Um, do you have a sense of when we're going to get the Donahue report for the Cress, um, Cress work they were going to do? Because some residents have been asking about that. And I don't, but I'll find out. Yeah. And the second one is, of course, the RFI. Has that been sent for the waste hauler? Could you please speak to the mic so yeah. we can sure? Um, has the RFI. So I talked with Gilbert about that tomorrow, this morning because I knew that was coming up. Um, and it has not gone from his desk to procurement, but he, I asked him to get that done today. I haven't confirmed that it got done today or not. So it has not gone out? It has not gone out for sure. Okay. Anything else, Shalini? Okay. Uh, Dorothy? Uh, two quick comments. Um, the first one is uh, thank you so much for the rectangular rapid flashing beacon or R F, I can't even actually do it. Um, R R F B that's going to be at Amity and Lincoln to make that crosswalk safer um, because it's it does present a real problem and I hope that it'll work. Obviously, there's some tree pruning that will have to be done because one of the sides signs is nearly blocked with a tree. So that is going to be something that the community will feel very happy because they've been asking for more safety crossing the street for a long time. Um, the second one is on page five, and the answer may be something very simple, and I may be just being totally stupid, but it says town staff are currently making adjustments to the configuration. In the near future, the town will be adding another downtown park and play area. Uh, so this is talking about, oh, you're not adding a down, you're, you're saying you're adding Wi-Fi to another downtown play area yes. park. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yes, grammatically. I read the sentence wrong. Okay. There is no new park. That's a surprise, but no, no, Wi-Fi no. will be available at yet another park. Well, that's good too. So I'll follow up the one quick question. How about the public restroom at um, Kendrick Park? Sure. So we have brought in a, um, a, a part-time uh, time limited capital projects person who's going to help us move these projects forward. And that's one of the top projects on his list. And he's really a terrific person and wrote people are excited because he's actually going to take these projects and move them to um, bid and then construction. So I don't have a time frame for it, but it's, it's, it's ARPA money that we need to spend. Good. Thank you so much. Jennifer. 
Um, I was surprised to see um, North Hadley Road, little North Hadley Road is being repaved. And I was just wondering, is part of the reason it has to be repaved because of the construction of Fieldstone? And no, it was in bad condition before then. Um, so um, it was in, is actually going to give us an opportunity to look at parking on that street as well. We might want to monetize some of the, the um, parking spaces on that street to get some of the revenue from people who might be willing to pay to be in proximity to the university. Okay, because I was going to suggest maybe the university reimbursed for paving that street, but yeah, needed it uh, before. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anika? Thank you. I had a question uh, for the uh, police chief search. Excuse mm -hmm. me if this has been um, said before, my volume went out a bit. Was there representation or is there rather representation from UMass, Amherst College and Hampshire College on the list? Um, we, we will for sure have UMass and um, I have not thought about, I've probably from Amherst College, I don't have thought about um, Hampshire, but we probably should include the, we might try to have one meeting with all the Howard Institutes of Higher Education mm -hmm. actually, so. Okay. Thank you. Mandy Joe. Yeah, um, a couple meetings ago, I asked about the RFP for design guidelines, um, and you said you'd get back to us on whether it was sent out and what the status of it is. Mm. It was funded like two and a half fiscal years ago. I don't know the answer. I'll look it up. I have to ask Chris on that. Um, Anna, you still have your hand up? Okay, Anika, you still have your hand up? I'll put it down. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, there is a very slim president's report. Are there any questions about it? Kathy. Don't have a question about the report, Lynn, but I do have a question about upcoming agendas, one of the items that was going to be on tonight. So just tell me when I should be asking that. Um, we're going to move to that right now. Future agenda items. Okay, Kathy. We had, we, Kathy, and then a few others chimed in, asked for a briefing on where we are with the library project. You had crafted questions and asked us from others. I know you were originally going to try to do it tonight, and you said couldn't do it. So just an estimate on when you think that might happen. We're, we're shooting for the 18th. Thank you. Okay. Um, Sean's departure has kind of thrown a few things off. Okay. Any other council comments? Seeing none, then I'm adjourning the meeting at 1029. Thank you.